Hi, everybody, and welcome to DeFi X Solo. I'm your host, Brad Tarosi. DeFi X Solo is the year's virtual event, bringing together crypto and blockchain industry leaders to talk about how DeFi is shaping the global economy. We have lots coming up, including several industry keynote speakers. Let's take a look and see who they are. I hope you're as excited as I am to hear from each of these speakers about their thoughts on DeFi. During the event, we'll also have a panel discussion about what investors should know about DeFi, moderated by Charles Bouvard. Sologenic is also excited to reveal its tokenization asset simulator to the world for the first time. You'll get to see first a live demo of how you can practice tokenizing assets from global stock exchanges in preparation for the release of the full tokenization asset platform coming soon. Make sure you stick around right to the end of the event, because there will be a live AMA with Sologenic's co-creator, Reza Basash, and Sologenic Chief Product Officer, Dmitry Litvinovich. Ask a question, and you could win Solo and Sologenic merchandise, including t-shirts, hats, and hoodies. You can also win Solo by tweeting either the event's YouTube or Twitter live stream links with the hashtag DeFiXSolo. So, Without further ado, let's get started. I'm pleased to welcome Sologenic co-creator, Bob Rass. Thank you, Brent. I want to welcome everyone to DeFi X Solo 2020. I'm glad to be here today to share some insights about Sologenic and the future plans, which will be announced for the very first time today. When we started developing the Sologenic ecosystem and the XRP ledger, we had one vision, to overcome the limitation of the traditional financial markets. Well, we felt it's the right time to provide the opportunity to millions of users to access the financial markets from every corner of the globe using blockchain technology. We had many obstacles to overcome. Every time I look at the past nine, 10 months, I feel nothing but pride. I'm proud of the team that has been putting in extra to make this happen. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to inform you that we are launching the simulator Sologenic tokenized assets ecosystem today. The simulator allows users to access global financial markets, trade and tokenize over 40,000 assets on demand. We are going to see a live demo of Sologenic Simulator for the very first time shortly. But before we move to the next part, I would like to share how Sologenic can potentially play an important role in the future of asset trading. Amsterdam Stock Exchange was the world's first official stock exchange, which allowed the public to trade securities in 1653. Fast forward to the 1987 stock market crash. SEC push for the electronic routers to handle customers' order. Before that, brokers, they were handling all the orders manually, mostly over the phone. That was the start of a digital era for stock exchanges. I think we all agree there has not been any significant disruption after that. However, there are more new technologies available today compared to those days, such as blockchain technology. 
So it's time to take advantage of the new modern technology and improve the user experience and provide more values for traders. Some of the key advantages of the tokenization of assets on the blockchains are 24 seven trading of assets. That means user can select any assets during the market hours from 30 global stock exchanges, buy and tokenize them on demand and even trade them on the DEX 24 seven. I believe it's important to pay attention to on-demand tokenization. That allows users to choose their choice assets rather than being limited to a certain available stocks. The other one is fractional trading of an asset. We have designed a new order type called pool order. The way it works, user can contribute any amount to the, to the pool and the system will execute the order as soon as the amount reach to one the amount of one. For example, if the value of a stock X is 100 bucks and the user chips in $1, once the order is executed, the user will receive 0.01 amount of that token. Self-custodial of the assets. User can create a trust line on Sologenic and transfer the tokenized assets to their private wallet or use the Solo decentralized wallet. The other one is the spending of the tokenized assets in real time. Users can spend tokenized assets in real time using solo cards anywhere in the world where the ordinary credit cards are accepted. These are exactly the primary features of Sologenic ecosystem. When we talk about Sologenic, it's important to understand that Sologenic can potentially help more people to invest in traditional financial markets. It's a win-win for everyone. Now, the interesting part, I would like to announce one of the effective solutions designed exclusively for the financial institution that we are currently working on. Solonex. Solonex is the next generation digital assets brokerage solution for financial institutions, including banks, brokerage houses, and investment firms globally. Solonex B2B solution is the most secure and scalable asset tokenization solution that has ever been designed for financial firms. We are currently working on the solution and we will start to promote and offer the solution to the banks and other firms accordingly. Solonex is a turnkey solution providing the financial firms to be able to tokenize assets, offer fractional trading, launch funding rounds like Series A, Series B, providing liquidity, and manage custodial services, all and all using blockchain technology. Obviously, we are going to release more updates on Solonex within the next few weeks. Thank you everyone for your time and I hope you enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you. Now it's time for our panel discussion, moderated by Charles Bovaird. Charles is Vice President of Content of Quantum Economics and a senior contributor for Forbes. The panel will discuss DeFi through the lens of investors looking for opportunities and the pitfalls in this compelling area. On the panel today is Hans Koning, Chair of the Digibyte Foundation. Carolyn Reckow, Head of Business Strategy at Keep, a network that provides a bridge between public blockchains and private data. Piers Ridyard, a serial entrepreneur and the CEO of Radix, the first layer one protocol for the DeFi industry. And Santiago Roel, partner at ParaFi Capital, a San Francisco-based alternative investment firm focused on blockchain and decentralized financial markets. Over to Charles.
Um, can the can the panelists hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, um, would you like me to repeat the question, or do you have it right in front of you, or would somebody like to hop in? I did not hear the question. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so I'll repeat the question. What are the most important things investors should know about opportunities in the DeFi space? I mean, for me, it really depends on level of sophistication. Um, there's sort of uh, th there's sort of huge number of layers to buying into the DeFi space or or, or, or just um, uh, allocating capital to the DeFi space. It, it comes down to a lot of the same fundamentals you would if you're allocating capital anywhere, like team. Uh, technology and, um, and and what the product is actually addressing, like what the need the product is addressing, and and whether or not it's addressing it in a in a sensible fashion. But um, there's all of these extra things that happen within within the DeFi industry, and in that capital moves very very quickly, often into and out of projects very very quickly. Uh, and there's a load of things that happen with bots and the way that you actually buy into and out of projects. That means that you can end up getting front run and things like that. Which means that if you want to be doing high frequency DeFi or you want to be moving quickly, then you're going to have to understand a lot more about how the code works than if you're just going, well, I'm going to put some money in here and leave it for you know six months or a year um, and there's sort of like this massive gradient between uh, having to really really understand the underpinnings and really easy to use things like sort of easy to use like Aave and Compound and things like that to sort of things like y uh, YFI or YAM um, which it sort of has all of these risks that I'm sure we're going to talk about when it comes to hacks and unaudited code and all that kind of stuff so like I think for me, the first thing is just pick your level of sophistication. How comfortable are you with crypto in general? And then yep. start from there. Okay. Yeah, that sounds perfectly reasonable. Would anybody like, like to uh, add to that? Yeah, I, I think it's very important to sort of start at the basis. Uh, you need to understand what blockchain is. You need to understand what finance is. And that, if you, com if you know those two, that doesn't necessarily mean that you understand DeFi. Uh, I know it sounds a bit cryptic and it sounds a bit weird, but it, it actually is. You need to understand that that DeFi is 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 a new and and a bit of a different uh, kit on the block in that sense in, in the blockchain space. I think it's very important also that you understand what kind of services it can actually offer. What is the the benefit? What is the use DeFi can actually bring to you? And I think uh, automated market makers, um, uh, collateralized lending or interoperability um, are a couple of things that are very important and brought to uh, the center stage all of a sudden by DeFi. And you need to have a good understanding of what that actually is and how you can can use it. And and I, I'm not necessarily want to uh, belittle people on, on the contrary, because we're all learning. Trust me, so am I. But you do need to understand that that you simply can't run into it. You need to be able to walk before you can run. And, and tempting as it as it might be, and and definitely looking at certain results that have been achieved in in, in the the bull run uh, we saw last summer um, in in the DeFi space. If you jump in now, that will not necessarily be the outcome for you. So, you know, there is always a caveat, uh, I, I would say. But that that's also an issue and a topic. I'm sure we'll uh, touch on uh, later on. I can jump in here. Um, I think it's important for this question to talk about the definition of DeFi. DeFi is the idea that you can assemble the elements of an economy, design them to function properly without the need for a centralized authority. So um, Bitcoin was the original DeFi, in my opinion, and the, the term itself is new. Um, and I think the whole ecosystem, crypto ecosystem, is benefiting from solidifying concepts around the term um, and concepts that became popular in concept with these real financial products that started cropping up specifically on Ethereum. When you look at projects like MakerDAO being one of the first ones and then other things like Compound and Automatic Market Makers that people have mentioned. Um, but really, I, I think the real significance in DeFi and these new projects is um, around avoiding centralization. So that means individuals can avoid surveillance, censorship, avoid their funds being lost or stolen, market manipulation. It's it's really just about financial freedom. 
I, I, I would actually disagree with part of that definition. I don't think I don't think that's that's wholly accurate. Like the, there are plenty of examples where there are nexuses of control in decentralized finance applications. Take any of the top ones, Compound, Aave, etc. For me, the, the 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 thing that's making DeFi exciting and popular for people is that you have a you, that it's essentially interoperable, frictionless, interoperable finance. I have three applications: Uniswap, Compound, and uh, and and MakerDAO, and I can compose them all together to create another financial product or to be able to arbitrage between them in a single block like that's what's making DeFi in my opinion that's what's making DeFi fly it's not it's not like the the concept of decentralization and anti-fragility I think underpins the the idea of crypto or, or public ledger technology but for me for DeFi it's much more about this ability to move money very quickly between multiple different product projects that are made by competing teams that create these incredibly interesting and exciting financial products that look similar in some ways and then very different in others to traditional financial products. Yeah, I agree. I mean, money, 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 decentralized money is important. Decentralization is important. But it, yeah, I wouldn't say that that's part of the core definition of DeFi, at least for me. I don't disagree with that at all, Piers. Um, to clarify, I guess um, when I spoke about centralization, that is more something that I think investors should be looking at when evaluating projects. That that's definitely it's a huge risk factor. Um, but but agree, there's a lot of projects flying around right now that have these these locus of centralization. Yeah, I mean, the, just to add in here and verify, all we do is invest in, in decentralized finance protocols. And I guess when we invert and we explain DeFi to, you know, bankers or, you know, venture capitalists or, or whatever, it's like, well, what if you had perfectly auditable collateral 24-7, 365? And, and I think that's, you know, people start getting really excited about that, right? And so a lot of what has been done to date is replicate systems of the economy to Carolyn's point that exist in Wall Street and porting them over to DeFi in, in what Pierce was saying, in a highly composable integrated system. Um, I think we can all agree here that finance just hasn't caught up with the internet. There's a very obvious reason for that. You can't move money the same way that you move information through packets. Um, you need a central authority. So, um, you know, I think we'll get there. I mean, it's not a perfect system by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, these things take time and there are certainly a lot of risks, but, um, there are early indications and it's quite promising how the system just works uh, and it's very anti-fragile uh, in some respects. It, it's, uh, it is, uh, it's not for everyone, I'd say. Uh, and so we're, we're very early still. And so there are plenty of risks. Uh, so, you know, just buyer beware. Reasonable plan. I mean, I suppose other terms you could put in there besides buyer beware is do your own research. That seems to be uh, buyer beware is is, is uh, probably a little bit more old school than do your own research. D Y O R seems like something that's pretty widespread in the crypto space. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so um, for the next question, we have: What do you think are the biggest potential pitfalls? that investors investors interested in DeFi need to watch out for? I, I, I mean, like numerous uh, and, and varied. Um, like the uh, smart co contract audits are massively important um, in the Ethereum ecosystem. I mean, it's one of the key reasons that we built Radix in the first place was because the way that people build decentralized finance at the moment is massively insecure. And as a result, you need this whole extra infrastructure. You build the application, but then because it's built in Solidity and because of how Ethereum is built and it's like very insecure and in how it deals with all of these input outputs and all this kind of stuff, it then needs to be passed to a specialist security firm who then goes and makes sure that the bug, but there can't be bugs in the code and there can't be problems that cause all of these things like recurring version issues that end up bit funds being lost and that's happened time and time and time again like we've had you know deep recently deforce uh we had yam.finance which had like 500 million come in and then 500 million flow out again like within 48 hours um and so there's this there's this there's this uh really difficult thing that every developer every per people who want to build decentralized finance wants to do is 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 oh there's an opportunity i want to build code really quickly but i can't i've got to then go and get it audited and so you're seeing at the moment all of these 
developers just putting out code that hasn't been audited that people are just yoloing money in uh and uh and 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 things go things go south things go wrong so like i'd say the the biggest the biggest thing for me in terms of a checkpoint is has this been audited by someone that's a legitimate company if you're thinking about actually putting some money in there and leaving it in there for a long time and not wanting to be sort of constantly checking to see if has there been a hack in the last hour um so that's my that's my number one pitfall that you want to re- watch out for if you're going to put money into anything once you've done your research okay uh a- adding on to that uh, for me the number one would be uh, trust and i think financial system blockchain technology stands and falls with uh, with trust and i just saw a comment uh, of the word rug pool uh, uh, and the sort of that reminded me of the word trust i think trust is should be key um in in basically anything uh and without trust there cannot be a, a system in, in in DeFi that comes back to auditing uh the smart contracts that uh, comes back to doing your own research fundamentally for me it's uh, it's trust and the issue sometimes with trust is that we th- we think we have blockchain so therefore we have trustless trust well that is definitely something you need to rethink again you can't just jump in because of blockchain so for me trust would be the number one issue fair enough yeah that sounds perfectly reasonable i mean the entire financial system is at least supposed to be based around trust right like <laughs> if people i mean th- that's basically like the strategic branding of companies they use colors like blue because blue is a trust color yeah yeah so yeah that sounds perfectly reasonable uh would anybody else like to uh jump in give their two cents on this particular matter the two sets uh would anybody else like to weigh in on this particular matter no i'd agree with everything that cares and pounds have articulated yeah um same i think um especially back to taking a look at smart contract risk and audits is probably one of the most important things when you're thinking about pitfalls um and uh yeah it's it's been an interesting um trend recently to see more token communities around DeFi develop around the concept of um this fair launch um, and so you saw that with with stuff like Yam and and Wi-Fi, um, and and this is developing a, a community of investors where people need um, to do some work to contribute to the code um, and be a little bit more technical, I guess, um, in order to participate. So you get these this pool of participants that are at a higher bar technically they have the capability to do some of this um you know do your own research and really get into the code and and look at um you know if something has been audited or or not and and things like that so yeah it's definitely interesting and i think it's a difference from when you look at the 2017 ico boom where a lot of these token projects were being marketed to people that were just very unsophisticated you know you didn't need to know much to click and buy some tokens with ether um so yeah i think with that you'll see some like losses and bugs with some projects because it requires this higher level of sophistication but i'm definitely excited to see just in general a more knowledgeable population playing with these tools right now um yeah. I think, okay uh, so maybe just to chime in here uh, one thing that should be important to note is uh, no amount of audits uh i mean audits are are not the be and end all in this industry uh, i mean you can have five audits and you could still have a bug i mean it, Unfortunately, until a system is out in the wild and there's value at stake, you're really not going to fully, I mean, there's a Lindy effect in systems, right? And so these things take time. And so um, to your point, Hans, I mean, you can't trust an audit. You can't trust right. anything, really. You have to do your research, but even assume that there is going to be some level of probability that there is a bug in the contract. And so I think there are you know if you're really not very well versed in understanding a contract and understanding reading solidity you know i think you you're better off just assuming that there could be a hack there could be a loss of funds and so you know plan accordingly right don't don't put your life savings in there uh these are experiments is how we think of them and and if you frame it like that and go into a particular protocol thinking that it's of, you know the expected value could be zero uh then you know i think it changes the mindset of how you approach investing in the space or getting exposure to these protocols 
just just to add one more thing that someone in the comments has said which i think is really uh important uh is rug pulls um it's a it's a it's a concept that people talk about in uh DeFi a lot at the moment which is when uh so for example when we launched our uh our token um on ethereum we uh seeded uniswap with some liquidity and that's often uh, that's often a thing that teams do to make sure that there's liquidity in uh the pool so that people can come and buy and sell now what we did is we went and locked that in something called unicrypt which means that you can't pull the liquidity out but what a lot of what has happened and like sushi is the best example of this is they build up the liquidity they build up the liquidity the number of people like putting putting their money into a project and then they pull all of their liquidity out which means that they manage to make a load of money from doing that and everyone else suddenly has a much less liquid protocol that they can actually sit in and because DeFi protocols run on liquidity like the the, the fundamental way in which anything moves in DeFi is as a result of things like conti uh, continuous function market makers or automatic market makers and that relies on the community providing liquidity if you're not if you can't see that the team has made sure that a rug pull can't happen or, or by locking tokens, by locking LP funds, all this kind of stuff, then you've got quite a high amount of risk just from the team coming in and being like, whoop, we'll take that. I think if I were to add very three simple parameters, uh, one of them you talk about here is, uh, is there a time lock uh, uh, that the team has? Uh, is the contract a fork or bespoke? There's very fairly well-tested staking contracts from synthetics and compound or governance contracts that you know, you're very easily able to compare, right? What has been changed? And the third one is uh, the price feed, which some folks have talked about flash loans. I think where you're pulling your price feed is is, is critical. I mean, most of these flash loan attacks recently have been around, uh, you know, on-chain price feeds. And so uh, I think it's it's important to recognize um, where the price feed is, is coming from because that can be easily manipulated on-chain through flash loans. So, I mean, these are three, but obviously, I guess the fourth dimension would be understand where the yield is coming from. Because if you don't, then you're probably the yield. So, um, you know, just kind of understand how and how yield or the ponzonomics, if you want, like, how's that working uh, is, is important. Okay, we, we got some uh, some great quotes in there. I'll, I'll tell you that right here. I like that one. Uh, understand where the yield is c coming from, because if you don't, it's probably you. I don't know if I quoted you verbatim, but pretty close, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. great. That was good. Okay, so as investors are, you know, evaluating different proje projects in this space, what key strategies should they leverage? Um, sure. Maybe I'll start. I mean, we think about this a lot. Um, um, you know, I, you know, there's a lot of excitement going on. There's many projects in the space, uh, almost shipping daily. And so I, I think, um, the most important thing that we think about constantly is, uh, really finding the highest caliber teams, very technically competent, um, uh, that, that can ship, uh, product and then focus on core use cases, right? Because no amount of financial engineering, now that we're talking about yield, can solve for a crappy product. That just does not work, right? And so if you think about what Carolyn and the team are building at Keep, like there is a very clear use case for what, for, for, like a reason of existence for, for building that bridge, right? Of connecting something like Bitcoin or Ethereum or, you know, Compound or Uniswap. Like these are products that you could see the product market fit. You could see the usage of these networks in real time and on chain data. And that's the beauty of this space. You're able to monitor traction usage of these networks. And so um, that, uh, you know, so, so I think uh, for us, it, it goes back to a fundamental kind of premise of investing, which is investing in things that users want and will use. Uh, and then you can start focusing on other sort of second order effects like a, or, or the token economics uh, properly designed. Is What is the Gini coefficient? What does the team own? Uh, what's their incentive to build? uh and some other components but it really just starts from the core premise of is what you're building actually has any real demand uh and usage so that would be my oh. sort of first parameter 
Okay, could I ask a quick question? Y you mentioned the Gini coefficient. Uh, usually when I hear about the Gini coefficient, I mean, I know I know what the Gini coefficient is. It's, it's a measure of the inequality of income in a society. But are you talking about the Gini coefficient of the people on the team? Or I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to. Yeah, someone, I think it was Piers or Callan mentioned this like pr proof of, uh, you know, like a fair launch distribution, right? I mean, I think what you don't want to see is two or three or four wallets or individual owners of tokens that control most of the network. A, it's not, it's quite centralized. And B, um, you know, also understand the vesting schedule of those people, of those participants and what is their incentive to continue to uh, build, right? In the case of Sushi, the developer anonymously, who is anonymous, could sell and his sushi at any moment's notice. And when you would ask him in the Discord channels, he would never answer and be very explicit around what his strategy was around holding all the sushi. Lo and behold, you know, he just dumped it, right? Yeah. And so, and then returned it. But um, I guess, um, you know, it's important to understand, like, what are the incentives? I mean, th th there are very simple things in traditional finance that work. And one of them are long vesting schedules for employees, builders, investors, right? And so if you have skin in the game and if you have skin in the game for a number of years, then that's always a good sign of commitment to building a product. Okay. Makes perfect sense. Okay. Um, let's see. Would anybody else like to uh, weigh in on that channel? I mean, not that channel, sorry, that, that particular uh, question. Uh, yeah, again, like, I, I think that, my, like, many of the same rules, like, um, just, just following on, um, from what uh, Santiago was saying, um, many of the same rules to assessing the the fundamentals are the same, like looking at the team and how long they've been working on it and and also whether or not they have what their track record looks like, how long they've been working on that, how long they stick with previous projects, all that kind of stuff. Um, I, there, there has been a rise of uh, anonymous projects, which makes that a lot harder to do. Uh, and generally, like I personally steer clear of those, um, just because of because of the problems that come out of not being able to identify people and then being able to just disappear at any point, means that the project can die, but also you can end up getting you know rug pulls and all these kind of bad things. Um, but you know, also just doing simple research like looking on GitHub and seeing how long how, how much activity is happening on GitHub, how how many developers are working on it, how so how good the code is if you if you if you do if you're able to code looking at code quality test coverage all that kind of stuff is all good way, good indicators of how thorough and diligent the 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 project is being built and also like if you depending on how good a developer you are like where where things are being hacked and it doesn't matter and where things where people are spending real time sort of developing the core principles again like are they rolling their own everything for no reason or are they like borrowing from good projects and good ideas that have come before them um and then you know just diving into the the economic side of things is is, is essential in DeFi um because fundamentally um these are running these are running projects like unlike what happened in 2017 a lot of these uh, almost all DeFi uh, applications are live and got money in them and and they have a they have a life that that starts as soon as the as soon as the developers put them live and if the economics hasn't been thought out properly or the way that the game theory is going to work and it isn't going isn't thought out properly it doesn't matter how good the team is uh, you'll still get a fa a failure as a result so like there's so many aspects to investing in crypto, um, but they always hit, hit this three, this nexus of economics, team, and to and and technology. And like, if those three things are solid, you're probably good. Yeah, I think we've covered a lot of great stuff throughout this conversation in terms of um, investor due diligence. So I'll just add a couple of things. Um, it, it, we've talked about token issuance and. Um, you know, the GD coefficient and, and where tokens are, are being allocated and unlocked. But I think um, a step above, it's also important to uh, look at actually like, well, what's the value accrual mechanism for the token? Is it a governance token? Is this something that, you know, uh, people can use to vote and change uh, and make changes in the protocol? Um, or is it a, a work token, a staking token? Is this something that acts more as fuel in a protocol? And, and there's a lot of different um, ways that you can look at um, look at those different mechanisms. Um, and then 
The other thing that I'll just say is on the tech side. So we've talked about, um, you know, audits and security and the um, the benefits of being more technical and being able to review code for yourself. But even if you know you're not a developer. Um, there's a lot of things that you can look for. You can look for is the code itself open source or is it, you know, not visible or visible. Um, you know, I agree with Santi, Santi that um, being audited doesn't guarantee that something is safe, but the fact that something is maybe audited more than once is always a good sign. Um, and then also you want to take a look at things like, again, I'll go back to centralization. Um, you know, not to say that a project that has an element of centralization is inherently a, a bad project, but there are risks involved with that. There are also risks involved with uh, being a less centralized project as well. So um, you'll hear people talk about projects having an admin key. So that can be the ability to, you know, start or stop a protocol or turn off different parameters. And so it's important to ask those questions about, okay, who can do what here? Is it just the team? Or is it, once it's live on the blockchain, is it pff, nobody can stop it? So those are basic technical questions you can ask. If, if I might uh, might add on that, I think to me, governance is, is, is more or less the, the, the crucial issue. Uh, so I agree with what you said, uh, Carolyn. And uh, governance, as long as there's a, a community involvement or participation in the governments, the structure of the governments, and also restructuring uh, of, of the governance, uh, I think that's a very important element for me uh, in any uh, DeFi uh, project, uh, which more or less boils down to transparency, which results ultimately, hopefully, in trust. So, you know, we all have our different triangles, and, and for me, you know, the, the trust governance and, and and transparency is, is an important triangle I always uh, like to uh, like to look at. Okay, let's see. Okay, so at this point we've got um, a few minutes left. We've got about uh, actually it's more than a few minutes left, but it's it's, it's less than ten. So. Uh, <laughs> Another question I have is what key steps should investors take when performing due diligence on DeFi projects? I know we've already gone over some of this. Um, so if there's anything in particular you'd like to add, feel free to do so. Okay, well, let me start then on this this one, uh, if I may. Um, well, when it comes to auditing for smart contracts, for instance, well, not, not everyone can do that. I, I can't, I'm not an expert in that. Um, and a lot of people, obviously, if we, advocate do your own research there is this point in time that you need to acknowledge your own limitations in that and i certainly have my limitations in this and it's a fast moving area we we live and we work in and uh, the landscape is constantly changing the, the product portfolios of office of services offered is constantly changing so doing your own research uh, is is in that sense also almost a, a mission impossible so you need to have help and i think you know someone mentioned discord or reddit or, or telegram there are lots of, of groups actually um uh de-threading you know code by code uh, a, a project join them listen talk engage with community uh, to get an involvement and a better understanding it's um it, it's not there's no shame that you can't necessarily do all the research yourself but at least reach out to people that can actually help you understand things so you know it, it's it, it, the, the power of it co of the collective in that sense is definitely something in my view you should engage uh, and, and embrace yeah that, that's that's uh some great guidance oh yeah and and, and obviously all always uh, you know it's a bit of a cliche but uh uh, not your keys, they're not your coins. Uh, always, always keep that in mind. Okay. All right, let's see. Um, would it make sense for us to take some questions from the audience at this point? Sure. I mean, I know we have some questions in the chat. So... Let's see, there's quite a lot of questions here. So I don't know, could somebody on the Sologenic team maybe point out questions that stood out to them as being great? Ah, here we go. 
somebody uh, somebody mentioned the term Ponzi-nomics. So uh, that's actually a pretty funny term. Santiago, I believe I believe you were the person who mentioned Ponzi-nomics. Yeah. Would you like to flesh that out a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, I mean, it was half jokingly, right? I mean, th th there's token economics and then there's, uh, and just understanding, what I meant by that is just understanding kind of goes back to this yield construct, right? I mean, what is the inflation schedule of a token? What is the uh, token distribution? What is the vesting schedule? Um, you know, there's different pools for certain farms, if you will, like pool one, pool two, pool three, just understanding, uh, you know, some of these concepts are, are not as easily understood, but I think it, it's important. It goes back to the prior question around diligence. Um, what are the, and, and Carolyn brought this up too, is like, what is the value accrual for a token? Um, how, what is the usage of the token in the system? Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, oftentimes when you start digging into how these things are designed, then it becomes, it can, it can, um, it can raise certain flags that uh, it will become kind of readily apparent that it, it, there's a either no value accrual or very strong value accrual, or there's uh, not very clear token vesting schedule for the team. And that's what I meant, really. I mean, oftentimes you see these opportunistic, you know, in any market, not just crypto, right? I mean, uh, you see um, teams that are just opportunistic and, and can launch a project, spin it up really quickly. And uh again it's just a healthy skepticism always goes a long way in this space right if the yield is ten thousand percent well you ought to understand how that works and and what are the risks there right i mean there's a reason why generally speaking there's a some correlation between higher yield higher risk right and so just understanding that right is important um it's, it's all i meant by that um so it's just a healthy reminder of of uh, you know, if, if it feels too, <clears throat> excuse me, if it feels too good to be true, then probably is. Yeah, no, that, that makes perfect sense. I, I like the, the description of healthy skepticism. That sounds, that sounds pretty good to me. I mean, you don't want to be too skeptical because it'd be hard to get anything done. Yeah. No, look, I mean, we, we, we play around a lot with these systems like yams and, and these are great economic experiments. Like they're fascinating, really. I mean, I, I, personally think that chapters in game theory and economics will be written for some of these protocols, even if they don't exist. Like it's just uh, actually right, like pretty novel incentive structures that are being cre like created on the fly and experimented, but they're just that they're experiments, right? So if you're going to put your life savings on, uh, on YAM, you sure as hell better know what kind of contract and how it works. Right. Uh, and so it's, it's important to, to just <clears throat> generally speaking, uh, approach it as an experiment and, and use funds as if, you're going to Vegas, right, for a weekend. Like, that's typically how, uh, you know, if it's going to be a massive success, then even a small amount will go a long way. But just, uh, you know, just it's important to approach as an experiment, right? I think that's one of the, that's one of the beautiful things about DeFi for me is this, um, it, it, you can you can you can experiment with small amounts of money like if you look at the way that central finance works a lot of the times it, it, you have minimum amount minimum investment amounts you have to get over a large number of hoops with DeFi. you can install metamask you can uh, get a small amount of crypto you know 100 bucks 200 bucks and you can play around with that to start off with yes the fees are going to kill you on ethereum because ethereum doesn't scale and there's all of these problems and that's why we be built radix but you know from the point of view of the average user yes you can go and play with a small amount of money in any of these projects any of these products and like DeFi, you you start getting it by just getting your feet wet a little bit. Don't be like, man, I'm going to put 20 grand in and it's going to be the first project I do. But like, there's nothing wrong with just being like, look, I'm going to see how this works as a user. Put 10 bucks in and just call it a cost of a cost of experimentation. And you'll start to feel what feels right, what feels wrong, what's intuitive, what's not, how good the documentation is. But you can really only do that by diving in and getting involved. It's very much a user experience thing, not not just a, I'm going to go read everything I can and then put it in. It's like trying to play a game just by reading magazines about the game. You actually have to play the game to understand how to play it. 
I that's, agree that's, with your, uh, your comment there. It's definitely, um, I like to I look at it as, as a sort of a tuition. Uh, it, it's, you lose some money, but you see it as a tuition. And, uh, and again, uh, don't, uh, don't run if you can't walk. Uh, so yeah, that's, I totally agree with what you just said there. Absolutely. Okay. Well, if, if nobody else has anything that they'd like to add real quickly, uh, we pretty much are running out of time at this point. So I think I'd like to, I'd like to take a minute to thank everybody who showed up to attend and watch this panel. And I'd like to take a minute to thank everybody who participated in this panel. And I'd like to thank Sologenic for putting this all together. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Well, absolutely. It was our pleasure. All right. Have, have a great day, everybody. Thanks, Bye, everyone. Cheers. All right, everybody. Uh, let's hear it again for Charles, our moderator on that fantastic panel. Uh, this is Brent here at uh, Sologenic HQ, and uh, we hope you're enjoying the event so far. Uh, so big shout out to all our viewers watching on YouTube, DLive, as well as everyone watching and chatting along here on the WebEx event. Uh, we love seeing everyone interacting in the chat, helping each other with audio issues, and otherwise being awesome. So please keep it coming. If you're enjoying the content here and you want to see or hear anything again, uh, make sure that you go to YouTube and subscribe to Solo TV, where we will release a playlist where you can rewatch all your favorite panelists and keynote speakers to your heart's content, and of course, see all the episodes of Solo TV. And we also want to take a quick moment here to remind everyone that you have some chances to win prizes while you watch. We are giving away 50 solo to 10 lucky people throughout the event to win. All you need to do is tweet the live stream link with the hashtag DefiXSolo. The live stream, the live stream link is dlive.tv slash sologenic. One more time, dlive.tv slash sologenic. Retweet that with the hashtag DefiXSolo and you could be walking away with 50 solo. Uh, and you can also find it on our Twitter page, at Real Sologenic, for easy retweeting. Also, at the end of the event, we will be doing a live AMA to answer your questions. I've seen some amazing questions being put out there in the chat. Please keep them coming. Uh, we're really enjoying seeing all the things that you have to ask the Sologenic team. So to take part in the AMA, find the chat box on the right side of your screen, type in your questions and choose to send to everyone. And Reza and Dimitri will answer them in the AMA later. Ask a question and you could win Sologenic merchandise. You can ask questions and chat to other attendees throughout the event. So please keep that going. Uh, we love hearing it. And now let's move on to our next speaker. When learning and getting involved with DeFi, the big questions are typically related to how revenue is created. Jeff Dorman, Chief Investment Officer at ARCA, a full-service investment management firm offering institutional caliber digital assets products, will be here to answer those big questions. He will cover why DeFi matters, how revenue is created, and how that revenue is extracted and distributed to token holders. Welcome, Jeff. Right, we'll uh, we'll go for it here and hope that it's working. All right, terrific. Um, as mentioned, I'm uh, Jeff Dorman. I'm the chief investment officer at Arca. Uh, Arca is a asset management firm based out of Los Angeles and New York, dedicated to uh, the blockchain industry and investing in different components of the digital assets industry. Um, our our core strategy is we have a uh, digital assets fund hedge fund where we are uh, taking a long biased approach. Uh, to different aspects of the digital assets industry. And obviously one of those aspects that has been popular recently uh, has been uh, that of DeFi. So, you know, just before we start here, um, you know, as a, disclosure, as a disclosure here, nothing stated in this presentation should be taken as investment advice, uh, which would require a thorough assessment of each investor's personal financial profile and risk tolerance. Statements regarding past performance are not necessarily indicative of future returns. Okay, to start with, um, you know, why do we care about DeFi, right? What, what is DeFi? Why, why is this important? Um, you know, go back to 2008. Uh, in 2008, 
we had a lot of failures across the centralized financial system, right? This, this created a, a, a ton of economic destruction, trillions of dollars, right? People lost jobs, people lost their homes, people lost savings. Um, a, a big part of this was counterparty risk with the individual banks and financial services companies, um, as well as completely uh, lax risk management procedures, um, as well as uh, probably even more important than anything, uh, a lot of these firms didn't even really know what they owned, right? They didn't even know what their exposures were. So when you think about why, um, when you think about why the uh, uh, blockchain took off in 2008, Blockchain took off largely because we were solving for what these problems were, right? Not only was Bitcoin uh, a form of a new financial concept for money, um, but overall what was then built on top of uh, a blockchain with the advent of, of Ethereum and some other blockchains and ultimately what has now been built, built on top of it, we can now take some of these traditional financial concepts that have caused problems for decades and we can uh, offer them without a centralized middleman. So what do I mean by traditional banking services and financial services? We mean, you know, what what does a bank you know, will effectively facilitate the lending and borrowing? You provide collateral, uh, you get interest for that uh, if you put that in the bank, and obviously they'll take your assets and they'll loan it out to people who want it. Um, insurance, right? Very simple concept. Uh, brokerage and trading, asset management. You go down the list, and all of these traditional financial services can now be solved by uh, uh, blockchain assets um, and decentralized finance sits at the core of that. So why is this so important? Like, what are, what are we really doing here? Um, ultimately, all of financial services works off of the balance sheet. You know, that balance sheet at a bank uh, is your customer deposits, right? That balance sheet at some other traditional financial services companies comes from uh, investor capital. But ultimately, it's the balance sheet that's being put to work. Uh, in these financial services, and you have your equity holders who ultimately accrete the value uh, of all the revenues and profits that come from this. So when you, when we solve for that uh, through decentralized finance, um, what we're really doing is we're turning unproductive assets, you know, any the everyday assets that are on individual consumers' balance sheets, and we're turning these into productive assets, right? So right now in decentralized finance, what does that mean? That means the tokens that you own. That means your Bitcoin or your Ethereum or maybe some other tokens uh, that you own, maybe even the solo token. Uh, you know, you can turn these assets that are just sitting there idle uh, on your personal balance sheet, and we can now use these as collateral to form that balance sheet of these financial services companies. As you think forward, you know where are we headed in the future. What this means is as every asset in the world becomes digitized every single asset you own can ultimately become collateral for some of these financial services, right? So think about other assets that are unproductive, uh, your house, your car, um, maybe even your electronics. Um, things that you own that have value right now are unproductive. And with the advent of decentralized finance, this becomes productive. And what we're really doing ultimately then is uh, decentralized finance is transferring the risk from central authorities to computer code. Once you have, once you can replicate the balance sheet that these financial services have, then what you can do is you can take away that counterparty risk, the things that got everyone else in trouble in 2008, the lack of risk management, the lack of oversight, the middleman. So that's what we're solving for. It's really simple in concept. It's incredibly complex in operation, right? When you think about central, centralized finance, you know, from your money to your banking, your exchanges, your brokerages, like there's a lot of companies, a lot of middlemen who are doing that. We're trying to replace all of that with computer code. Um, you know, I don't expect everyone in the room to understand how this works. I don't understand how, how all of this works, right? I'm not a software developer. I'm not an engineer. Um, I am uh, uh, utilizing these services in, in the same way that a consumer does, and then we're finding ways to invest on top of that. But again, you know, it all comes down to what are we solving for? We are taking the assets of people and individuals. We are using that as the balance sheet, uh, making it productive, and then ultimately you get rewarded for supplying that balance sheet. So we're taking the value away from traditional equity holders and we're putting it into the hands of the actual consumers and users of the platforms. So once you build a community of developers and companies and all this stuff uh, that, that powers a decentralized finance community, you are basically getting rid of this dynamic of middleman, equity holder and customer, and you're making it all one group, right? Your customers are your equity holders or your quasi equity holders, and they're the ones who power uh, these 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 applications. 
So how do you pull that off? Um, you know, uh, Charlie Munger once said, show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcome. That's effectively what decentralized finance is, right? First of all, you have to figure out why is this being built and how is it being built? Um, you know, DeFi protocols have to, first of all, they have to accumulate capital to even run their protocol. So you can crowdsource initial liquidity by selling a token. Um, you know, over time, as you generate revenues, you can retain some of those revenues and put that back into the balance sheet. Um, and, and you have to identify who the players are that are going to be a part of this, right? There's basically four key players. You have the liquidity providers, which we already talked about. These are the people who are providing the capital onto the balance sheet of a decentralized finance application. You then have the token holders, um, those who are governing the protocol and ultimately should be extracting the value in the form of dividends or some other type of financial uh, uh, mechanism. And then obviously you have your developers who are the ones who are building on this and they need to be incentivized as well. Um, and then you have your customers, right? So, so this is these are the four main groups of people who are going to use these applications. And we have to figure out how do you incentivize all of these different types of people to get this to work. And once you do, it can be incredibly powerful. Um, I stole this from the founder of Synthetics. Um, uh, he was tweeting about how do you set all this up right? And this is not an easy feat, right? You know, sometimes we take for granted traditional finance, um, you know, with regard to it, it's easy to build something when you have a CEO and you have a management team and you have single leaders, right? Well, somebody has to take on the ownership of a decentralized finance project to start with, and they have to think about all of these incentives we just talked about, right? How do you, how do you set up these rules? How do you govern it the right way to start with? Well, if you're going to use a token to incentivize growth and incentivize people to, 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 to fund that balance sheet, well, you have to think about the distribution, right? Am I, am, how do I distribute these tokens to users versus my own development team versus management, um, et cetera? Um, you know, once I am uh, figuring out that token allocation, uh, then I have to figure out, well, well, what are the dynamics, what are the mechanisms with regard to how value is going to flow? You know, is it going to be a utility in the form of you get discounts for owning a token when you utilize the platform? Or are you going to get some sort of an explicit uh, value back in the form of, um, you know, are you going to get explicit value back in the form of, uh, of some sort of a dividend? So all these things are what a decentralized finance team has to think about before even launching. Okay, so all that out of the way, you, 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 the, the main holistic takeaway here is the traditional financial services model can be replicated. And when it's replicated, you're going to have a variety of different players and each of those players has to be incentivized in some way, shape or form. That's great. Ultimately, what is that incentive? And this is where I will probably break from what the majority of the people today will tell you, right? A lot of the people who are in decentralized finance are somewhat libertarians. Uh, they believe in a decentralized future. They don't like middlemen. They don't trust governments. I'm not going to go that far. For me, I'm pretty capitalistic. If there's money to be made, people are going to try to extract that money. And that is ultimately what DeFi is doing. DeFi is still extracting the same amount of money that traditional financial services are extracting. The only difference is you as a consumer and you as a token holder can benefit financially from this instead of just watching the management teams get fat uh, and happy and, and the equity holders win. So all you're doing is you're transferring not only the risk, but now you're transferring the value capture. Because these protocols can actually uh, generate economic value, as a result, you can value them. So any traditional investor will tell you that if you can model cash flows or you can model yields, you can come up with some form of valuation as to what a, uh, an equity or a debt instrument is worth. The same thing is through, just true now of tokens in this space. Because there's a real balance sheet that is storing billions of dollars in assets, facilitating billions of dollars in, in, in transactions, there are fees that are going to be extracted. And these fees that are extracted ultimately can flow to some of the, you know, to one or more of those players we just identified, right? Your users, your liquidity providers, your developers, uh, et cetera. So these, 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 these protocols uh, that when they start to work, you can see the dollar numbers are real, right? And we can start to value these. You can use traditional valuation metrics like price to earnings and price to sales. You can see at the bottom left there, um, you know, a, a lot of the protocols that are built today from Uniswap, the clear leader in decentralized trading to Compound and Av, which are doing lending and borrowing, um, you know, to, uh, 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 you know, down the list to insurance like Nexus Mutual, there are real earnings that are being generated here. And the entire fight for decentralized finance is going to be, how do you distribute those earnings? How do we take the total value locked, which is the balance sheet that we're providing, turn it into earnings and come up with a way to distribute those earnings. And once we figure that out, 
whatever portion of those earnings are delegated to token holders, you as a token holder can then value this in a traditional metric. Um, and that is a lot of what investing teams like myself are doing is we are valuing these tokens, which is one component of how all of DeFi works. Okay, so the, so one of the questions we get a lot then is, well, if we're, if, we're, if we're removing all the middlemen, why are there fees to begin with, right? What is the, por what is the point of extracting these fees? Um, well, again, the fees are extracted because this is the incentive mechanism. None of this works if you're not able to have some sort of revenue generation uh, uh, process. So when I think about, um, you know, when, when I think about the, the, the capital, users providing their capital and what the exchange values are, um, there can be there can be value that it's extracted intrinsically, meaning you know you might take something off the platform that you are able to then sell like liquidity mining, or you might get something that's more extrinsic to the system, which is like you know traditional dollars or or stable coins or things like that that you extract. But ultimately, you know this extraction of the value is what keeps this entire engine going. Um, and again, that might be more of a capitalistic approach than than what some uh, developers or software engineers will tell you. But I, I truly believe that that is, that is the only thing that keeps this going is, is not this holistic dream of decentralization, but rather taking this financial, uh, uh, taking these fees and, and extracting this revenue and giving it back to the people who are more important, the actual users of the platforms. Um, so basically what we're saying is these fees become savings, right? You are effectively giving, you're giving, the, the protocols are giving back to the users in the form of these fees or in the form of these distributions of tokens. So all this leads up to, well, well, and I heard someone on the previous panel talking about governance. Why is one of the things with regard to token ownership, why is one of the mechanisms governance? Well, governance by itself means nothing if there's nothing to govern, right? And that's why a lot of governance tokens to date have completely failed. It's, it's, it's great to have a, a, a vote if there's something worth voting over. If there's nothing worth voting over, you don't care. Well, that's why DeFi has actually worked, is that because of these revenues, because of these billions of dollars of capital, there's something actually worth voting over. And you as a token holder get to participate in this. And this is why it's so exciting that, that, that you can not only be uh, a customer, but you get to be a participant in the growth of these engines. Um, so the way we see it in terms of governance is there's actually two types of value that you can extract, right? One is divvying up the actual fees and revenues, which we've already discussed at length. The other is potentially positive externalities, meaning if I have governance over Google, uh, you know, I may want to put something on the homepage of Google that directs people's, uh, you know, directs traffic or directs interest to some other thing that I own. So governance might not just be about extracting fees, but again, there's just no reason to even care about the governance unless there's some sort of value to be had. So I'll give you two examples of, of why this is why this matters. Um, you know, for those who are familiar with Arca, uh, you know, we've actually been in a battle with a company called Gnosis to try to get them to return uh, capital. Uh, Gnosis is sitting on uh, an incredibly large balance sheet, not because of anything that they've done. They've generated no revenue. They've just collected money from a 2017 ICO. It sits on their balance sheet, and we're arguing that they have not they've done nothing productive for Gnosis token holders. So therefore, they should give the money back to us. Um, that's an example of we we're stuck as token holders, right? Um, you know, if you have the resources and the uh, uh, you know the, the research team that we do at Arca, you can certainly make a lot of noise and you can try to force Gnosis to give back, or you can even take them to court and, and, and try to fight a legal battle. But effectively, you're just hoping management does the right thing, right? They have control of the assets. You as a as a token holder are just a passive participant, and you're hoping they do the right thing. You compare that to something like Uniswap, where uh, here's a company that has real revenues, has real product market fit, um, and you know there is going to be uh, to token holders are going to help control where that revenue goes. Currently, 100% of the revenue goes to the liquidity providers, those who are actually helping to, um, uh, uh, like I said, provide the balance sheet that makes Uniswap work. But over time, those fees are going to be distributed out uh, potentially to token holders. Um, and you can see that if that happens, one of the proposals that's out there right now from a government standpoint is that one sixth of all the token, or one one sixth of all the revenues are going to be distributed to the token holders. If that happens, now you're talking about real revenue. You're talking about one sixth of three to four hundred million dollars of revenue uh, on a token that only has a seven hundred million dollar market cap. So you're looking at a a, a low uh, double digit dividend yield, uh, a two times price to sales ratio, and eight times price to distributed cash flow. These are real economic. Uh, drivers that that anybody in the traditional debt or equity world would love to have, 
but now you can have it as a token holder while also being a customer of the project. So we think there's a big difference in controlling the vote and being able to, to dictate where that revenue actually goes to versus being a passive equity like owner where you're at the mercy of management hoping that they do the right thing. Um, and this, by the way, extends well beyond tokens, right? A lot of people like to say, well, I would never own a token because they have no they have no explicit rights like I do as an equity holder. But the reality is, as an equity holder, you only have explicit rights if a company goes bankrupt, in which case you obviously have a claim, um, or uh, if there's a dividend and they actually give you the money back. The rest of the time as an equity holder, you're just betting on management. You're hoping that they do the right thing, right? There's nothing stopping the management team of a public company from investing their assets in a completely irresponsible way. Uh, other than a board of directors, but you as an equity holder have no real vote or say into how that money is going to be utilized. With this new decentralized finance comp uh, uh, concept and the ability to own a token that has governance votes, you now have a direct say. You can vote on these things. You can be an active participant. So this is a huge, huge, huge departure from the traditional financial system and something that we're incredibly excited about, not only as investors, but as users. Um, so I'll pause there. I don't know. I, I haven't actually seen any of the questions coming in. Um, so I'd be happy to answer anything that did come in. But for anybody who wants to learn more about ARCA's view on decentralized finance, how we're investing in this space, uh, please feel free to check out our website at, at ar.ca uh, or email us at ir at ar.ca. Do you ever wonder what happens when we tokenize and monetize our physical property? Or what would happen if we could tokenize natural capital assets like the fish in the sea? Blockchain technology is enabling more than monetary exchange. Next up, we have Hillary Carter, the Managing Director and Director of Research at the Blockchain Research Institute, that will discuss how blockchain is changing the way people commercialize physical resources. Hi, everybody. My name is Hilary Carter. I am the Managing Director of the Blockchain Research Institute. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about monetizing the physical world and how that is disintermediating the world of finance and is part and parcel of the whole decentralized finance conversation uh, that we're having in a broader capacity today. So let me just share my screen and we'll get started. So um, for some background, um, at the Blockchain Research Institute, we are exploring how blockchain technology is transforming the world as we know it along different industry verticals. We're investigating uh, the myriad ways that this technology is disrupting education, government, uh, supply chains and, and logistics, manufacturing and so on. Um, but we think that probably the most profound shocks will take place in um, the world of, of financial services. This is, after all, the Internet of Value. And so uh, it's hard not to uh, think about disruption in, in, in those terms. So let's begin. Uh, we, we happen to believe that uh, blockchain is not a standalone technology, rather that it will underpin all of the other technologies that define uh, the second era of the internet, the second era of the digital age. So it will be the transactional platform um, that secures stores and facilitates the trading and monetization of data and of, of, of other types of value that are generated by these other technologies, including machine learning, uh, autonomous vehicles, drones, and robotics, et cetera. So that's sort of how we see blockchain. It's not um, 
uh, a technology unto itself, but rather it, it converges very effectively with other technologies. And to begin, I wanna begin um, with uh, an organization and a story about one of the first organizations who really pioneered uh, this idea of, of tokenizing the physical world and transforming markets as a result of, of that innovation. So uh, one of the earliest groups to pioneer um, experiments on the Ethereum blockchain was a group called Slocket. And they have really paved the way to help monetize um, the physical world through their developments. What they wanted to do was connect an inanimate object to the Ethereum blockchain. And that object that they were successfully able to connect through IoT and um, Ethereum was a bicycle lock. And what they were able to, to do was have physical objects perform certain functions when monetary conditions were met. So essentially they set up a smart contract for a bicycle lock. And when a micropayment of Ether, uh, the native token to Ethereum was sent to that bicycle locks smart contract address, the lock would open, assuming that, that uh, the full amount of Ether was received and all of the conditions uh, needed to operate that smart contract were met. And what this, did was, was create a new kind of universal sharing network or open the door to a new kind of b, &B a new kind of Uber, a new kind of bicycle sharing that was decentralized. The payments didn't necessarily have to go through a financial services um, institution or a bank or um, a, a credit card in order to exchange value and exchange um, resources. So. This was um, a really revolutionary development. And I think it's had a profound um, shaping of the whole blockchain ecosystem. You may also know Slocket as the group who uh, first created the DAO, the Decentralized Autonomous Organization um, that was set up uh, kind of as a, a, a mutual fund investing in different blockchain projects that was subsequently uh, breached um, and uh, led to the forking of the Ethereum blockchain into Ethereum Classic and the Ethereum um, that that uh, is largely responsible for having um, built out the DeFi ecosystem. Salkit has gone back to its roots after the learnings from the DAO. And those big takeaways were a determination to make um, resilient smart contracts and uh, the learnings won't be forgotten. Uh, these were foundational lessons that have influenced the auditing of smart contracts and uh, created an entirely necessary spin-off industry. So what did that innovation create? Well, where I'm based in Canada, there is a new kind of blockchain-based ride-sharing app called Eva. Um, Having a, an application that allows for greater um, data privacy where, where riders, passengers, data is not um, owned by the application, uh, where passengers can actually participate in uh, the economic upside of the solution that they're using, passengers can still have an affordable ride, much the same as they would if they were to take an Uber. But the primary difference with this kind of sharing network is that the majority of the value that's created stays in the community in which it was created. 50% of that ride doesn't go to Uber in Silicon Valley. 85% of a ride goes to the driver who, who provides the service. And in this case, Eva uses a cooperative model, which opens the door to shared revenue. Uh, riders become members in the cooperative. At the end of the year, riders can uh, enjoy part of the profits from this service. It also opens the door to a shared model whereby a municipality can join the cooperative um, and participate in this kind of economic activity. Right now, municipalities the world over aren't too terribly happy with Uber because um, they extract value from the economy and they don't give back to it in, the, in terms of, of uh, taxation. Municipalities have to provide the road maintenance, the police services, um, 
shoveling snow in many cases, uh, in, in, certainly in cities around Canada. And uh, consequently, they um, have not been well received. Uber has been kicked out of countries like Colombia um, because they're not contributing enough to the local economy. Decentralized applications that connect the physical world um, to a market are going to be more effective in the long run. Now they have implementation challenges, but this is the kind of sharing network that um, Ethereum and, uh, and other blockchain innovators have been able to create. Now, one of the things that uh, tokenization of the physical world has also created is the opportunity uh, to do some good environmentally. So there's a group that has built on Ethereum um, with the intention of preserving life below water by tokenizing it. And you'll see here in this photograph that this is a water-based drone and it's taking water samples and it's using environmental DNA to actually count the fish stocks and to identify them as unique species within a marine protected area. The problem that they're solving is that they are um, creating data about a resource that's otherwise not very well studied. We, we really don't have a good idea of how much life exists below water. And now we have the technology to better understand that. And when we know what we've got, we can take um, steps to preserve it. So in this case, if, you, if this water-based drone is, is counting fish stocks and different life forms within a, a fixed um, square kilometer area, it can tokenize that data, secure it with blockchain technology, and then translate it into economic value for a government to say, look, this is what your fish stock is worth. If you don't protect it, this is the economic consequence of losing that natural capital asset. So through better data, through tokenization, we create new opportunities for both monetization, but also preservation. So this is one of my favorite cases that uses so many different technologies um, to have a different kind of conversation about monetizing our assets, whether they're whether it's gold in the ground or fish in the water. So what we have now, which is super exciting, is decentralized marketplaces. And I think one of the most disintermediating um, activities of the future will be when I can tokenize my land, my title, my house, and pledge that in a secure fashion on a blockchain platform and borrow against it. That to me is the killer app, the most threatening uh, activity that could really undermine uh, the financial services sector as we know it. This is bread and butter business for banks and um, borrowing against property is expensive. Um, blockchain enables us to do this now incredibly efficiently. We don't need that brick and mortar infrastructure uh, to leverage assets in our possession. We can also now do this with uh, fine art and wine and other types of, uh, of, of physical um, resources and, and commodities. And so what's going to happen when everybody has this secure method of, of collateralizing their assets? I think it's um, something to really think about. I think what we have is now unique opportunities for lower cost finance and fractional ownership of assets that were otherwise financially out of reach. So this opportunity is both democratizing, but also incredibly disintermediating and financial services as a sector should be paying very close attention to finance through tokenized physical assets. Similarly, I'm excited about uh, the gaming market and uh, beginning with CryptoKitties and evolving to what was recently la uh, launched by the CryptoKitties creators Dapper Labs um, was NBA Topshop, um, a new kind of digital collectible. 
and they're leveraging blockchain technology to buy and sell scarce digital assets. Um, this is this is a really amazing new marketplace, and we've got a new uh, class of of market, new opportunities to monetize assets that we enjoy collecting, that we enjoy interacting with, and doing this in a secure way. It's creating new markets for everyday people, and not having to go through. Um, the traditional intermediaries in order to trade and participate. Uh, so gamers, uh, I think this is um, an incredible uh, future that's unfolding right now. And I'm, I'm looking forward to both uh, participating and uh, watching how it develops. So what's the big message here? I think um, banks and financial services um, versus decentralized finance is somewhat equivalent to Blockbuster uh, versus Netflix. Banks have an opportunity here to rethink their value proposition to their customers. I think their future is going to be one of trusted custodian of private keys and trusted custodian of digital assets. Um, I think there is a role for them. I just think that DeFi is making them rethink uh, their, their business model. So this ultimately is not just a technology play, it really is a business model change. And um, it, it's certainly something that everybody, um, not just in financial services, but other industries will wanna watch very carefully. As for the DeFi ecosystem, I think that it's incumbent upon uh, the industry to build responsibly. Uh, I mentioned early in, their, in the talk about the DAO and uh, the hack, but it, it hasn't, you know, the DAO is just one story that I think in, in fact ended uh, well, that's my perspective, um, where uh, trust um, was prioritized over the immu immutability of code. I think it's really important to build trusted technology um, the industry is rife with uh, tools that have uh, been compromised, tools that have, have um, let us down in many, many ways. So we need to get the technology right and build that trusted tech. But also we need trusted leadership. Um, we've seen too often uh, the abuse of um, leadership positions and um, you know, organizations like Quadriga who have um, let us all down. And we need leaders to um, stand up and advocate for this space to be one of integrity um, and one of best practices. And that brings me to my third point, the need for cross collaboration. Uh, building out a DeFi ecosystem will require um, coming to terms with best practices and regulatory requirements. They exist for a reason. They exist to protect consumers. And I think in order to be successful, this ecosystem will have to collaborate with some traditional um, frameworks. And yes, that includes regulators. And above all, I think we need to build customer-centric tools. If we want to have migration to new networks, we need to have a user experience that is far um, easier to navigate than it is today. And it builds in things like human error. Um, so it's an extremely exciting time. I'm watching to see how the DeFi ecosystem unfolds. And uh, I look forward to uh, hearing from others uh, during this conference. So thank you so much. Uh, keep in touch if anyone has any questions feel free to reach out to uh, me at the Blockchain Research Institute or check us out at blockchainresearchinstitute.org. Thanks so much. Our next speaker will be Sologenic co-creator Reza Bashash. Reza is an engineer turned entrepreneur, founding several successful tech companies over the last 10 years. Given his in-depth blockchain knowledge, Reza will be discussing asset tokenization on the XRP ledger. Welcome, Reza.
Thanks, Brent. Hi, everyone. My name is Reza, and I am the co-creator of Sologenic. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about tokenization on the XRP ledger. But before I start, it's important to understand what tokenization or digitization actually means. Tokenization is basically the process of representing an asset in a digital form. It's been around since the beginning of the digital era and is being practiced already by all financial institutions and used by almost everyone, including yourselves. For example, the cup of coffee that you paid with your credit card this morning is actually being paid using tokenized money. Banks tokenize almost all their assets, and you most likely hold a digital representation of your asset. Another example is when you are buying a stock from, say, your local brokerage firm. They are not selling you the physical certificate of the ownership or a tangible piece of paper, but rather an IOU or a promise that you hold the asset with them. They might actually be doing the same thing with other liquidity providers and other local brokerage firms or subsequently exchanges. So most likely all assets um, are represented as IOUs in this chain. This process is nothing new, but we can revolutionize it by harnessing the power of the blockchain technology and representing these assets in a transparent, secure, and a more cost-effective way that is also accessible by the masses. Today, most investment opportunities are not accessible by a large percentage of the global population. Some of the benefits of the tokenization on the blockchain are um, removing geographical barriers, say, um, someone from Peru can now invest in an asset that's being offered in California uh, with all the security, speed, and ease of the blockchain. Now that assets are accessible by a much larger population, liquidity in these markets will be improved significantly. And of course, users can now buy and sell in fractions. This means, again, a larger contribution by the global population, rather than limiting trading for professional investors or institutions only. Once an asset is tokenized, you will no longer have to be paying fees for brokers or third parties. Trades can now be conducted on the blockchain without any other intermediaries. That saves you a lot of money and time. You can diversify your portfolio between uh, across different uh, asset classes. Um, so you no longer are bound to be investing in a set of assets offered by your bank or a brokerage firm. You can convert in a matter of seconds, such as converting your XRP um, assets to shares of, say, Tesla with just uh, one click. And of course, other key factors of tokenization on the blockchain are transparency, are immutability, and it is blazingly fast, especially on the XRP ledger. We have evaluated many different technologies as candidates for our tokenization platform. Every chain has pros and cons, obviously, but the ones that we seriously considered were Ethereum blockchain, uh, ERC20 standard and others, and the XRP ledger. We found that the XRP ledger almost offers exactly what we needed. Regulation obviously played an important role in our decision-making. XRP Ledger allows us to comply with the regulations by using a feature called authorized trust lines or trust lines in general. And of course, um, it is fast, it is secure, it is environmental friendly, and it's the big, one of the biggest things, the uh, built-in decentralized exchange capability of the XRP Ledger offers a significant value for our users who can exchange tokenized assets on the ledger. Other things that were a key factor in our decision-making were ability to interact with the tokens after they are issued. For example, paying dividends or handling stock splits and so on. On-demand tokenization is a great feature of Sologenic. It allows investors to tokenize any asset offered by the platform on demand this allows us to offer a significantly larger portfolio of assets in our platform. 
where supply and demand actually decide what needs to be tokenized. Generally, these tokenized assets can be bought and sold in fractions on the blockchain, but we also wanted to break down the process further and more and have accessib more accessibility for our users. So we created pool orders where users can contribute in pools of trade to be tokenized. This gives our users the power of tokenization or in tokenizing on the blockchain with a much lower capital. We have three main actors in this whole ecosystem. One is Sologen that acts as a brokerage and facilitates the technology for an asset to be tokenized. The second is the user who decides what needs to be tokenized and invests with uh, any amount of capital and tokenizes an asset. And finally, the third is the user who trades, buy and sells um, these assets on the blockchain in fractions 24 seven. This allows any user to conduct things like market making and um, other activities on the blockchain. So for example, a user comes to Sologenic platform and decides to conduct uh, market making for Tesla. They can simply tokenize uh, 10 shares and um, take it to their personal wallets and start market making on the blockchain. And of course, they can detokenize or burn or redeem these tokens um, at Sologenic by selling them back at market prices. So in a nutshell, Sologenic is a bridge between traditional financial markets and assets and the blockchain. Some of the challenges that we faced were, um, of course, meeting the regulator's demands were one of the most important things. What we've done here uh, on demand tokenization has never been done before. Even if you see, for example, a stock or an asset uh, from a stock market is offered on the blockchain, um, different other blockchains, it is most likely that it was tokenized and it was offered for trading, but for Sologenic, a big challenge was to show regulators that we are meeting their regulatory requirements and demands, and we're in compliance um, for on-demand tokenization. And of course, at the same time, educating a disruptive technology wasn't easy. Security of on-demand tokenizations is very tough, and it needs to be um, done very precisely because this, these types of systems are prone. And if an attacker or a hacker gains access to um, the issuer or the gateway wallet, they can potentially uh, issue any type of assets. So it poses a big risk if the system is compromised. And so that's why we, we designed a very um, sophisticated system that uses the uh, multi-signature capabilities of the XRP ledger, where each signer acts independently. These signers are placed in an unknown, isolated location. And I mean, they are separated in different locations and they sign transactions um, once they check the validity of the transactions with one another. Um, so this gives us the peace of mind that if one system is compromised, the other ones will not sign the transaction. Um, so these were some of the challenges that we faced. I will be available to answer your questions and during our AMA session with our Chief Product Officer, Dimitri. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the rest of the event. And thank you so much. Now, it's time for Sologenic to reveal its tokenization asset simulator. The Sologenic team has been working hard to launch this key element of the Sologenic ecosystem. And now the time has finally come to demonstrate how you can practice tokenizing stocks from global stock exchanges. Here's the demo. The Sologenic tokenization asset simulator gives users the ability to test and tokenize assets on demand with practice money from NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange. Get real-time quotes, professional charting tools, multiple order types, 24-7 support, 
competitive training fees, and cutting-edge security. Let's take a look at how to use it. The Trade section in the Simulator mode allows you to monitor, research, and trade stocks and ETFs from NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange currently. We will be adding more exchanges and assets as we develop the platform. To help narrow down your search results, you can search individual assets. Filter by specific stock exchanges, by geographical region, asset types such as stocks or ETFs, or only search for exchanges that are currently open. The Browsing section allows you to broadly review assets such as stocks and ETFs from specific exchanges. You can also filter assets by their popularity and view your favorites by clicking the star icon. You can view assets that you recently searched for and view assets that have gained or lost the most today. Now, let's take a look at how to buy, tokenize, and sell assets. When you click on an asset, like Amazon, you'll be brought to this page. Here you can view basic information, such as the price, volume, and charting tools. Other sections such as the most recent news and company information will be coming soon. A new trading feature on Sologenic is called Pool Order. These kinds of orders allow you to invest in stocks regardless of what the share price is. This means that no share is too expensive and makes it easier for you to diversify your portfolio. A good example of this is when you split a bill with your friends at a restaurant. Each of you pool your money together to pay the bill. The only difference here is that you receive a fraction of a tokenized stock depending on how much you have contributed to the pool share. For example, the price of Amazon is more than $3,000, but I only have $100 to invest. In this case, I would use a pool order since I am unable to purchase one whole share. I first click on Contribute, or the Buy button. From here, I select which fiat currency or crypto I want to use to purchase the asset. It is important to note that you can buy using any asset available here, which will be automatically converted to the base currency that the exchange operates on. If you are buying assets from the New York Stock Exchange, for example, your funds will be automatically converted to the US dollar. In this example, I'll use my Sologenic funds for the tokenization of Amazon. When you enter the amount you want to buy, the pie chart will inform you of how many other users have contributed funds to the pool and how much of a share you will receive. In this case, $100 will get me about 3% of a share in Amazon, or 0.03 Amazon shares. Once there are enough contributions from you and or other users to this pool to purchase one share, the order will be executed at the market price. Your tokenized Amazon share will then be available in your Sologenic account. Click Continue to confirm the trade. Here's another example. Say I wanted to buy 1.5 shares of an asset. The pool order will be partially filled until there are enough contributions from other users to fill the pool. Here, I will tokenize Starbucks and use my US funds. I'll enter the amount that is equivalent to 1.5 shares and continue with the trade. When I head over to the orders section, you will see here that about 43% of the order has gone through. Now, I just have to wait for the next pool to be filled to complete this trade. The other two order types that I will show you today are limit and market orders. However, it is important to note that the live version of Sologenic will include many other order types that you can use. Now, let's do a limit order for Tesla stock. First, select which currency or crypto you want to buy with. This time, I'll use my XRP. Then, enter the number of shares you wish to buy and your limit price and continue with the trade. Once the price reaches your limit order, the trade will be executed. The next order type is a market order. I will use my USD funds this time and trade Tesla again. Next, enter the number of shares you want to buy. Click Continue and Confirm. Since this is a market order, the order is executed immediately. In the lower right corner, you will see that my order has gone through, and soon you'll see another pop-up indicating that the Tesla share has been tokenized. When I click on the eyeball, it takes me to the Testnet XRP ledger where I can confirm that the asset has been tokenized. This is the Testnet XRP Ledger Explorer. The transaction ID is unique to my trade and shows me the amount that was tokenized. 
we can see that the issuer was Sologenic. Now that I have my tokenized asset in my Sologenic account, I can withdraw these funds to my personal wallet and trade them on the decentralized exchange. To do so, I must first create a trust line by going to the decentralized exchange section. A trust line is a relationship between the tokenized asset holder, you, and the issuer of the tokenized asset, which is Sologenic. This relationship is essential in order to withdraw your tokenized assets to your personal wallet and trade on Sologenic's decentralized exchange. To start, click on Add Trust Line and enter your tokenized stock. In my case, it's Tesla. Then, click on Add, which will provide you with the current information. In this case, the currency is Tesla stock and the issuer is Sologenic. I then go to my XRP wallet. In this case, I'm using the XRP toolkit but soon, you'll be able to do this on Sologenic's decentralized exchange. Click Add Asset, then Custom Edit, where you can then copy and paste the issuer and currency information. Then click Next and Confirm. Here, you can see that it has been successful. However, the trust line is unauthorized. To authorize, you'll need to head back to the Sologenic platform. Click that you have entered a trust line and continue, which will bring up the next window where you can enter your XRP address. We may have to wait a few seconds, but the trust line will be authorized, which you can see here. Now, you can withdraw your assets by going back to your portfolio. To withdraw, Scroll down to the Tokenized Assets section and click Withdraw. Enter the amount you want to withdraw. I'll withdraw half a Tesla share, then enter my wallet address and press Continue. From my XRP wallet, you'll see that I have received my 0.5 Tesla shares. If I want to sell these shares on the decentralized exchange, click on Trade. I'll use a limit order. where I'll sell 0.3 Tesla shares for 210 XRP. I'll enter my order where you can now see it in the order book. Now, that's a real definition of DeFi. Now, I'll head back to the Sologenic platform to show you some additional features. The Portfolio section also allows you to easily deposit and withdraw your fiat currencies using various payment methods such as wire transfers, e-transfers, faster payments, SEPA, and more. Both the Sologenic Assets and the Coinfield Assets tab allow you to view your fiat currency wallets on both platforms. In order to tokenize assets using fiat, you'll need to have your funds in your Sologenic wallet. For example, if I have $10 USD in my Coinfield account, and I want to tokenize an asset, I will first have to click on the transfer button, enter that I want to transfer 10 US dollars to my Sologenic wallet, and press continue and confirm. Your cryptocurrency funds are always held in your Coinfield wallets, so there will be no need to transfer your cryptocurrencies between the platforms. When you select a cryptocurrency to trade an asset, such as Solo, your Solo will be automatically converted with a market order using Coinfield's trading pair to the base currency of the stock exchange you are using. If I want to, I can easily convert my cryptocurrencies on Coinfield over to my Sologenic Fiat Currency Wallet using the Convert and Transfer button. Here, I'll convert 100 Solo to US dollars. The History section allows you to view all your tokenized trades in chronological order, while the Tokenized tab allows you to view the transaction on the Testnet XRP ledger. If you decide you'd like to cancel an order, you can do this in the Order section. Any trades that are still open will be shown here. To cancel any of these orders, press the X button. Thanks for watching our demo of the Tokenization Asset Simulator. If you'd like to try it out for yourself, you can sign in using your existing Coinfield account or you can create an account on Sologenic.com. I am excited to welcome Felix Mago up next. Felix Mago is the co-founder of Dash Next. With Dash Thailand,
Felix has established the first crypto payment ecosystem in Asia. Felix published the Bitcoin Handbook, and he is the co-founder of the BlockTech Institute. Felix is also a guest professor of blockchain at UCLA. Felix will be discussing the potential for the global adoption of DeFi. Welcome, Felix. Hi everyone, my name is Felix and I'm here today talking about DeFi with you once again because this year has been super excited, especially when it comes to this topic. I think everybody in the blockchain space now knows a little bit about it and let me share stuff we are doing with you. Let me share my screen. Here we go. So Felix is my name. I'm from Dash. Um, I am running several um, projects within the decentralized Dash network. I will tell you in a second which one. And, you know, we are one of the early blockchains out there. We started in 2014, way before um, the word DeFi was invented, so to say. But in fact, you know, we always were and always have been um, a decentralized organization. And we are doing payments because Dash stands for digital cash. So, you know, in a way, we always have been into DeFi without, again, uh, having this term ready. So, you know, I want to talk a little bit today about um, how we and also other um, rather first-generation blockchains are now shifting uh, or, or coming into uh, what we call this DeFi space and a little bit of what is happening in the blockchain space and uh, in terms of how different blockchains start now to interoperate with each other, which honestly makes me super, super excited. So as I just said, Dash stands for digital cash. So, um, you know, we're doing a simple, a simple use case in blockchain. And in fact, one of the early use cases in blockchain, which is payments, and you want to do that very good. You know, payments mean, um, number one, that payments have to work, of course, but it has to work in a way that it's fast and efficient, low fee. And this is exactly um, what we are doing. You know, we want to provide a very customer centric solution um, that enables people to pay and merchants to accept cryptocurrency. And in the last years, we have established um, huge merchant ecosystems around the world. So people can buy essentially many, many things from all industries and all verticals in Dash. To give you some examples, you know, you can uh, have a restaurant meal, you can book your travel, you can go online shopping, you can get vouchers. So there's a lot of things you can do. And I really invite you to check it out, to come to our website and there's some uh, a map you will find there. So check it out what you can do with it. I promise you, uh, you will like it. Dash is, I mentioned that we are a decentralized organization, but not only that, we are a decentralized autonomous organization. And the word DAO or the concept of DAO in 2020 has become so popular. You know, another thing that makes me super excited and super happy because I think we are the first ones who since 2014 really have proven that this concept um, is something you can run an organization on. And you know, this is uh, uh, really exciting. One thing that means being a DAO uh, means we are, you know, not, um, we, we are not an organization that where you can say, hey, there is Dash, it's a registered company with the CEO, like basically all other organizations out there that are not a DAO. Um, instead, Dash consists out of several teams all around the world. And, you know, these teams kind of work independently from each other. But of course, it's on us to align, to align these teams, you know, so we have established a, a great processes and, and meetings. So, we, you know, uh, keep on aligning our strategies and our efforts to be, you know, to, to, to act like a, a great and efficient organization at the end of the day. I mentioned I am the, uh, the co-founder of several entities within this decentralized organization. So I am, uh, we, we founded the project you can see on the, on the side here in Asia, 
which is um, dash Thailand, dash Philippines, and dash Next. But on the other side, you know, there's there's many organizations uh, similar to us. Dash Core Group, probably the most exposed and famous. In they're they're located in the states. Uh, we have Dash Venezuela, Dash Nigeria and Africa, or Dash Brazil. So there's a lot of um, uh, things happening in Dash. And again, I'm super happy that with exactly the structure you see here, we have established um, a great merchant or great merchant networks around the world and really give, you know, adopt to local markets with local needs and uh, bring value to the people who are using Dash and to the merchants who are accepting Dash. Another thing, that is very, very important being a DAO is um, a funding mechanism we have in the background. And I want to explain a little bit how that works. So as in other blockchains, we are you know, producing block. That's what a blockchain does. And every uh, with the production of every new block, there are rewards generated. Most blockchains you know, just give them out to the miners. In Dash, it works a little bit different. We distribute these rewards into three uh, uh, different pots, if you will. One is the miners who um, ensure the security and the integrity of the of the network. Um, then we have master nodes who are decision makers and also have a security function for our network. And number three is the treasury. And with that treasury, we are funding exactly the teams you just saw, but we are also funding um, project beyond that. So we have a proposal system that uh, you can find online and every 30 days these block rewards are distributed to or some of the, these, the block rewards, the block rewards that are allocated for these uh, for the treasury are distributed among the teams who apply for it and um, distributed in a way that you obviously have to get uh, voted into that. And again, the master nodes, um, the master nodes are the decision makers. So every master node has one vote for each proposal in this system. And again, this way, you know, we have established, let me go back for one second. You now we have established exactly this, um, this ecosystem where we have teams that are operating, most of them for, for quite some time and have established operations, you know, building partnerships, building these merchant networks and um, bringing, you know, ensuring the success of Dash as a whole. Um, I think a lot has happened, especially in 2020. And, you know, we, we see prices going going up, up, up for, for quite some time now, which is obviously exciting for everybody who is working in the space. But there's a good reason for it, because um, in my opinion, or the way I see it, 2020 has some some major differences to the last years we have been building for so long and finally we are at the point where many of these companies in the blockchain space come out with working products there's stuff you can use you know you can do stuff with blockchain suddenly and this is uh, something very new for blockchain and you know to be fair we are such a new technology we need time to to build these products to you know to make blockchain work for end consumers and for end customers. And one of these things, or the, probably the major thing is everything you know, we call around DeFi, everything around decentralized finance, especially in that, um, in that area, you know, all these products and different companies come together offering, offering services. And this you know, in uh, general has led to a very, very positive sentiment suddenly, or a change of sentiment that, that in my, uh, personal opinion went from, oh my God, it's blockchain, when when finally we, we bring something up to, hey, wow, there's so much happening. It's just a matter of time when the next product and the next customer comes in. So this is really, really exciting. And also Dash is part of it. Um, we are about to release Dash Platform, which is the first you know, major release for a long time in, in, in Dash that really changes a lot of things. and really will drive value in the foreseeable future one of the you know very it, apparently very basic features is changing from cryptic addresses to usernames i think that's a very exciting thing um, that is happening and from again from user perspective really brings a lot of new value we have um, decentralized apis and the decentralized cloud system um, that that 
uh, you can use for all kinds of use cases. And you know, as it is with blockchain, the moment you enable uh, developers to build something, you can expect the, the craziest things and the, the most amazing things to come out. And exactly this is our invitation. You know, everybody um, who has something or you want to learn more how to use this, please, please, please approach me. I'm super happy to guide you through. We have already many ideas, you know, such as decentralized payroll solutions or, um, uh, you know, these, everything around, around payment in, in a decentralized way that you can build on Dash. So I'm super happy to, to, to share some ideas or to discuss your ideas if you're interested to build. And going back to this proposal system, obviously there are also funds available for this. So if you have great ideas, you know, let's talk and let's make something happen. Um, last but not least, there's data contracts um, you know, that uh, 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 kind of enable all these new um, apps to work together and you know, to, bring, to bring new value. So again, let's discuss, reach out to me if you're interested in that, super happy to uh, discuss ideas. One other thing we just launched in the recent past is uh, something called FastPass Network. So for this, Big shouts or shout outs, especially to Dash Core Group and Omar, who was, you know, uh, really getting this up and running. So super proud to, to see this happening. FastPass is essentially um, a network that uses one distinct feature in Dash called Instant Send because we are a, we have in fact a super fast payment network. And this feature called Instant Send enables any transaction to be finally confirmed. Um, within seconds without waiting for any block confirmations, right? So if you uh, have other blockchains, you usually, if you send money from A to B, you know that you have to wait for a certain amount of block confirmations. This can be something between uh, uh, five, and I recently saw something with 500 block confirmations. With Dash, you don't have to wait for any block confirmations. You send your cryptocurrency and you can immediately resend it or respend it to whatever. And if you now look at the different use cases, there, you know, sometimes it's it's key to be fast. I mean, not only if you if you are at the at the restaurant and just had a coffee, you know, you don't want to pay, wait for an hour until they let you go because only then your payment is confirmed. Um, if you are a trader and let's let's assume you are an arbitrage trader who goes from exchange to exchange to you know leverages the price inefficiencies, um, speed is key. So you know for that. And for many other use cases, this um, uh, uh, instant send feature really brings a lot of value. And what we have done is integrated this feature to a number of partners. So now we really have a whole partner network available to send you know, transactions in Dash in lightning speed. And that you know, enables not only these new trading use cases, but it also makes everything we have built up just working very, very smoothly together with um, payments and merchant networks and everything that is connected to that, you know, and now we're bringing more and more partners in and also, you know, this is the idea we spin and there we come to DeFi. Um, we would like to have, you know, this kind of fast pass network integrated as well into, into the DeFi space so you can, you know, send transactions back and forth. But coming now to DeFi, what does it mean? Um, one thing is, and I think this is the, the, one of the key things to, to solve before we can do anything is have a, a dash that is working with or on other blockchains. And the way to go there is having a wrapped asset. So, you know, we essentially built a, a copy of dash that is running on, on other blockchains and that is linked one to one to the original Dash, of course, in a safe, uh, sound and secure way. And the moment you have that, essentially you open the doors to a lot of things. I have heard a very good example to visualize that. And you know, you could, could say in the past, blockchains have been really, um, have had ecosystems that are like, like, like a little island, you know, this the island is, is you, you, you are on your island, you can do a lot of things within your ecosystem but you cannot just take, uh, go on the bridge and, and drive to the other, let's say to the Ethereum island, and then you can do things together with Ethereum. So what you know, these, these wrapped assets are now enabling is essentially having a bridge to go to other ecosystems and to, to use products and services that are there, right? So 
you know, other blockchains can now use uh, by having this wrapped asset stuff on Dash because they can go back and forth and we uh, uh, are enabled to use things that are going on there. And as you might have seen already in the last years, there's super cool yield generating products coming out, lending, staking, borrowing platforms, yield farming stuff. So there's a lot of things happening. I don't know, of course, there is a, a not everything is good, but there's many, many amazing things, and you know, it's it's uh, it opens now from our dash perspective what we want to provide uh, to the users. It opens the door to do you know many many new things and generate value for our users in a completely unique way by building partnerships with partners that were just not relevant for us before, and now when we have this wrapped asset are super relevant and I'm very happy to you know to reach out to them this is stuff that is in process one of these partners and uh, you know a very important one here is stakeout because stakeout is now um, the company who is helping us to build exactly the thing I just described this wrapped asset onto dash and you know again we, we always think from the consumer and customer centric perspective, um, the way we want to do it is essentially that a user can send an original dash to StakeOnt and in return, he will receive a staked dash. And with that, just by simply by holding this staked dash, which is a one-to-one -one representation of the original dash, you are able to earn rewards. And why is that? I showed you before we have um, uh, a block reward distribution that goes to master nodes. So, you know, Dash always has been, if you will, a, a yield generating coin in that sense. But before you had to have 1000 Dash in order to have a master node and in order to participate into the staking. 1000 Dash is quite a lot of money um, and not everybody has that. So now essentially everybody with just just by having this stake dash is enabled to run a master node because what it enables essentially is a, a fraction fractal ownership of a master node but not only that you will also you know with this system uh, get initially some stake count rewards and there is many many other options we are currently working on and um, i will be able to share with you probably in, in the next month. One thing I can already point out is obviously if you if we are now on, on Ethereum with this wrapped asset, you are able to participate in liquidity pools. And as you all know, liquidity pools just by participation, you are able to earn um, trading fees, you know. So if you put your money into a Uniswap liquidity pool, for example, you will get trading fees based on the number of trades and the trading volume within these systems. Of course, the last, last but not least, the, the, an amazing use case is that you now can take your stake dash and use it in many of these new um, DeFi protocols on Ethereum. So again, I'm already in process on, on building completely new partnerships for dash in the Ethereum ecosystem or with companies that that are built on, on, on Ethereum or even on other blockchains. Um, and it enables us or it enables the, the people who have the stake dash to really do a lot of things. Um, I just mentioned the liquidity pools, right? So automated market making is, is definitely one of the, the big use cases that also includes arbitrage trading because again, dash should be represented one-to-one. -one, and as soon as there is a market inefficiency, it's um, a chance and potential for a trader to go in there and uh, level out this market inefficiencies. Borrowing, lending, staking, you know all about that, right? But my vision as we are a payment coin and really what we bring on the table is this fantastic merchant and payment network we already have established. And I think we are far ahead of, of most other um, projects in the space there because you know it has a lot to do with uh, partnerships with payment processors, payment gateways, fiat on and off ramps all around the world. Um, and of course, with merchant integrations. So I think we have uh, quite a lot to, to bring to the table here. And you know, uh, my vision is a bit then to say, you know, it's amazing to earn money with DeFi and to, to get yields. But 
also it's amazing to spend money and to have uh, some good products and some good stuff you can do with it. So my vision is, you know, to, to also enable everybody who is using a stake asset to come back to the real Dash blockchain and uh, spend their interest or their yields for something they like and for something that makes everybody happy. Yeah. And with that, I'm done. Thank you very much. Again, approach me, please, if you have any ideas of stuff we can build together on the upcoming Dash platform. Thank you very much for the invitation. Reach out to me on either Twitter, Felix Mago, M-A-G-O underscore Dash, or on LinkedIn, Felix Mago. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Next up, we have Dr. Ben Gertzel joining us from Seattle. Ben is the CEO of the decentralized AI network SingularityNet, a blockchain-based AI platform. He is also one of the world's foremost experts in artificial general intelligence. With his decades experience in applying AI to practical problems, Ben will be discussing how AI will revolutionize decentralized finance. Welcome, Ben. Right, you can begin. Okay, all right. Well, yeah, it's a it's a pleasure to be a be a part of this uh, this event. There's been a lot of interesting stuff here, and uh, I hope I can uh, add uh, add a little bit to the overall picture being painted uh, regarding you know the present and future of decentralized finance by looking at some particular ways that I think uh, AI can can help in, on on the on the DeFi side. So I, I mean, you know, AI has played a really big role in the traditional finance space for for quite some time. Right? I, I mean, I remember in the 1980s, the prediction company out of Santa Fe was was you know, applying AI and nonlinear dynamics and pattern recognition to futures and, and equities. And, you know, by now, you know, Rentech Medallion Fund, the most successful hedge fund ever, is a pretty advanced machine learning based fund. So traditional finance, AI is nothing new. Decentralized finance so far has not made heavy use of AI technology, but I think, uh, it's certainly going to, and there there's some reasons why AI can even be more impactful in the in the DeFi world than in the traditional finance world. I mean, it, the the data that you have on hand from from just the fact of everything being on on, on the blockchain. I mean, the the data available in in principle is you know richer and uh, and more detailed than you have in traditional finance, which which gives the AI the AI much more to work with, right? So, I mean, I, I think there's there's tremendous potential here. The application of AI in decentralized finance, uh, you know, it's quite broad and diverse. And I mean, just as we've seen traditional finance, almost every aspect of DeFi is gonna is gonna use AI. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on some particular applications that that. I'm involved in for the next uh, few week, few minutes here, but I, I mean these these applications I'm gonna tell you about because they're what I'm working on. I mean the, these by no means exhaust the the full application of AI in the, in the DeFi space. And you know, from a broader view, I think we should we should look at you know DeFi and then AI DeFi. We should look at this from the point of view of decentralizing and democratizing risk and the understanding of risk i i i, I think that uh, you know it's really not a good thing that large investment banks like goldman sachs at this point probably have the best 
you know, risk model of, of the global economy. They probably have the best model for predicting the probability of different events, both good and bad. It's it's even though I'm not the biggest fan of, of government, I mean, it's kind of crazy that these large essentially predatory corporations have better risk models of the world than than democratically elected governments do. But I mean, with blockchain and decentralized finance, among other blockchain applications, we, we have the potential to make it so that, you know, the whole community of, of humans on the planet participating in, in the decentralized economy have have the best risk model in, in 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 the world right and i mean that that's that's how, how it should be understanding of the risk of major events in our economy in our society i mean these should be this understanding should be should be demo- democratically spread uh, across everyone not concentrating a few companies or, or or governments right and i mean the specific angle that I, i've been looking at this from has has had to do with what can we do with decentralized finance to help earlier stage cryptocurrency based projects so most of the defi out there now and it's a lot of a lot of very very cool stuff but i mean most of it is is to do with you know bitcoin ethereum you know futures defined on top of bitcoin and 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 ethereum and you know this is this is is great to see that the the creativity coming out there and the amount of of energy that's 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 going into it however you know the next wave of advanced technology on on the planet including ai technology but also you know net, net, networking gaming uh biotech I, I mean social networks you name it the next batch of really powerful technology on the on the planet is arguably going to come out of you know decentralized projects that are building their own tokens and their own secure decentralized you know token based blockchain infrastructure so then the the question is like what can we do with decentralized finance and ai defi to help with with you know lower liquidity cryptocurrencies particularly those that that correspond to you know up and coming advanced technology products and i mean of course of course this is a, an issue that was foremost on my mind because of the singularity net project that i lead which is a blockchain based ai platform which has a publicly listed token the the agi token and then singularity net has been has been thinking of spinning off a number of other related projects with, 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 with their own tokens. But this isn't just about me and my projects. I mean, if you if you look at, say, Ocean Protocol, uh, a big data altcoin project, they've recently introduced something very different and interesting called the, the initial data offering, right? So in Ocean Protocol, anyone can upload a data set and the data set can be accessed via secure blockchain-based methods organized in a decentralized way. But now every data set that you upload can optionally get, you know, a, a, a token associated with that with that data set, and that's really cool. That like the 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 token for your DNA or something can 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 be automatically generated and can be can be bought and 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 sold and such. On 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 on, on the other hand, uh, we don't have a good ecosystem for managing these sorts of lower liquidity tokens. And I think this is something that that AI and DeFi can help with, which can then help create more liquidity and and value for for these technology projects associated with that with with these altcoins. So yeah, with that prelude, let me uh let me see if I can share my screen and dig into a few of the details here so is that is that screen share working okay yep we see it thank you okay great so we're going to talk here about a project called singularity dao which is uh basically an attempt to use ai and, and DeFi together to to uh boost the the whole world of uh, of lower liquidity 
altcoins. So, and this is both, it's an interesting system in itself. You can find out more about it looking at singularitydao.ai. There's a white paper there and, and so forth. We're looking at launching this fairly soon, but as well as being interest, you know, unto itself. I mean, th this is, uh, it's an example of some of the things you could do with, with AI and, and DeFi. So we're, we're looking at a, a number of different tokens here in a uniquely configured ecosystem, right? So there's what we call Dynaset tokens, which are a bit like token sets from set protocol. And these are, these are basically weighted portfolios, weighted baskets of, uh, utility tokens and th these could be you know large cap or smaller cap utility tokens they, they could be nfts and so then a user can buy can buy this token which is sort of like an etf for a bunch of utility tokens and then that's managed by by an ai robo advisor which rebalances it and which can can bring things in and out in and out of it and then you can stake these etf like dynaset tokens if you stake these, then you know, the longer they're staked, the more yield tokens you can get. Sing yield tokens is, is a yield farming aspect. I mean, these, of course, can have futures and options defined on them. And then the, the stake tokens can be borrowed and they can they can then be be arbitraged and, and traded using, using AI algorithms. And finally, if if you hold your your Dynaset tokens long enough, your baskets of altcoins, you can get governance tokens as well, which, which which are also liquid. So there's a there's multiple layers here, as you see in this slide. I mean, the bottom layer is the actual utility tokens, which can be NFTs or, or tokens for, you know, advanced technology projects and AI gaming, you know, bi biotech, uh, net networking, graphics, whatever other domain, domain it may be. You have these data sets, which are dynamic portfolios, then these are traded by robo advisors, but also when they're staked, they can be borrowed by AI algorithms that that then perform other trading and 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 then return their money after the, after their their trading is done. And so, what we see here, you know, we have an ecosystem that, in theory, could work without AI. I mean, you you can look at. at ETFs of lower liquidity altcoins, and you can yield farm on them, and you can govern those without AI. On the other hand, in practice, there's too much going on for people to deal with. I mean, you, if, if you have a basket of, you know, 20 or 50 lower liquidity altcoins, and you have futures defined on that, and then you're trying to, you're trying to arbitrage that against other baskets that overlap with it across multiple DEXs. I mean, there's, in practice, no way to do this without, without some level of of ai in there because there's there's too many moving parts there's a lot going on and of course one can say well then just don't do something so complicated just trade bitcoin right but on the other hand if you want to really create more liquidity and more value for the startup technology projects underlying these altcoins i mean then you do need to you need to confront this complexity and ai is extremely valuable here and that yeah that's uh all this can run on the singularity net platform these ai agents so you've got a whole bunch of different tokenomic transactions going on here right you have these dynaset tokens wrapping up utility tokens sing yield tokens and then governance tokens and then i mean on on the back end to get the ai business done on different levels you're using the agi tokens from singularity net platform to get the ai based prediction and 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 risk analysis done and of course ai agents running on singularity net i mean these these can outsource work to other ai agents on singularity net they can also they can also outsource work to agents running in say ocean protocol or or other other de decentralized networks so you, you you're, you're really seeing here you're seeing an application that can really highlight the the amplify the power of a decentralized ai network like like singularity net but but also the the power that we get that we get from DeFi and all the unique unique methods that that we have there like uh you know ETFs non-custodially 
curated uh, ETF like instruments and and yield farm tokens and and governance tokens and 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 so forth. So yeah, to to wrap to wrap up, I think you know we're still at early early days for decentralized finance, and I I'd be the first to admit there's a lot of you know weird uh, pyramid schemes and and scams and and badly written unaudited code and stuff. That there's a lot of mess out there. There's also really solid projects out there, like your MakerDAO co compound finance to to token set and so forth. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to generate really profound value for multiple sectors of the economy using decentralized finance. And with Singularity DAO project, you know, my colleagues at Singularity and I are, are exploring one one piece of it, which is how do you you know, increase value and in liquidity for the, the ecosystem of lower liquidity altcoins. But there's there's going to be a lot of other pieces falling in, in into place. I mean, just to briefly mention one more project before wrapping up. So one of one of Singularity Net partner projects, uh, Autonio. I mean, they're they're working on uh, a system for basically decentralized market making for lo lower liquidity altcoins. So so to to make it easier you know, in a purely decentralized and automated way to make it easier for a new up and coming altcoin to to help help make a robust, highly liquid market for their token on, on DEXs. And, you know, th this can also use machine learning and reinforcement learning to automatically look at the order books and do automated market making. But then, of course, that complements what we're doing in, in, in Singularity now, because on the, on the back end of all these... Uh, aggregated ETF type tokens we're making, you need you need robust market making. So the, the interoperation of say a singularity DAO relying on singularity net AI and an Autonio, you know, decentralized AI based market maker, probably also relying on singularity net AI. I mean this is this is a one example of how you can get interesting operation between different AI DeFi systems. And I think I think this this is part of the DeFi ecosystem we're going to see emerging, emerging over the next year. I mean, we're also, of course, going to see machine learning applied in more sort of customary fashions. Like people are already applying applying machine learning to arbitrage, you know, Bitcoin futures with different maturities and and so forth. So there's there's going to be a lot of diversity here, and hopefully, I've given you a window into into some of the interesting aspects that uh, my team and I happen to be playing with now. We've come to understand the potential for DeFi to shape the global economy. I am excited to welcome Michael Stevens, to discuss the rules and regulations about DeFi. Michael Stevens is a leading information technology law partner at Faskin. As an experienced M&A and securities lawyer, Michael counsels emerging growth companies from their foundation to IPO or an exit event. Welcome, Michael. All right, everybody. Unfortunately, it looks like we're not able to get those technical issues line, uh, ironed out with Mike. Uh, so we'll see if maybe we can get him on later. If not, we will be sure to have him uh, record his comments and have that go out onto our YouTube uh, playlist once we release the entire event. Uh, so again, more encouragement to go check out uh, the Go Solo TV channel on YouTube where all of the speakers and panelists from this event uh, will be reposted so you can watch at your leisure. Uh, but now we are very, very excited to move on to our AMA. So let's hear a little bit about that. Up next, we have a live AMA with Sologenics co-creator Reza Basash and Sologenics Chief Product Officer Dmitry Litvinovich. So it's time now to get your questions in. You can ask about the simulator, tokenizing assets, DeFi, or any other part of the Sologenic ecosystem. Ask a question, and you could win Solo and Sologenic merchandise from the Solo store. Let's get started.
All right, everyone. Uh, I am so excited to uh, do this AMA. I hope you are excited to listen. Uh, allow me to uh, welcome uh, Dimitri and Reza here to answer your questions. Uh, I'm going to go through the questions here. I do apologize in advance for any uh, mispronunciations, but uh, Dimitri, Reza, please say hello to our wonderful audience here. Hello, everyone. Yes, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, at this event. I hope that everyone is excited. So we are just going to jump right into the questions here. Uh, the first question I have here is from uh, Dimitri uh, Rukrak, who says, did you have any problems with regulations? Or what are the biggest problems regulators still need to face? Well, yes, I can this question. And um... Basically, I think nowadays every uh, DeFi, DeFi project faces uh, certain issues with the regulators. And this is absolutely fine because the uh, regulators, they just cannot uh, keep up with the pace of the current fintech industry. So meaning that uh, uh, we had uh, quite hard times explaining how uh, we coexist with the legacy uh, financial products and how we uh, bringing these technologies such as blockchain, tokenization, DeFi on the top of the uh, classical investment services. But um, having said that, I think uh, the background is definitely changing. So uh, we see on our field experience that uh, the regulators are becoming more flexible towards there's no uh, new technologies. And I think uh, it will be in the nearest future that we'll see this uh, kind of a massive adaptions uh, of the DeFi and tokenization across multiple jurisdictions. All right, so our next question comes from Christian Voades, who says, what is the difference between CFDs and the tokenized assets that, are, that you are going to provide? Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to cover this question as well. Uh, and uh, basically, the CFD is the completely different trading instrument. Uh, the main difference, I think, that uh, not that I think that the main difference is that actually the CFDs doesn't provide any uh, any uh, custody or underlying assets to the uh, trader or to the user. As for the tokenized assets, uh, we can look at it as an, an actual company share that uh, a user can keep at the Sologenic platform or withdraw to his personal crypto account, uh, wallet or even trade at, at the decentralized exchange. Um, in addition, the tokenized uh, asset gives the user uh, voting rights uh, so we can, uh, he can vote uh, for the company as well as say, uh, uh, it gives a uh, user a uh, right to receive dividends that the company pays to, the, to its shareholders. Okay, so our next question here comes from Duncan White, and he asks, if, for example, I want 30% of a share and the current pool only needs 20%, would I have to wait for the next pool to be funded? Yes, that's uh, an interesting question. Thank you. So, uh, in that example, uh, what will happen is that uh, uh, once the pool order um, built uh, for an one equal share, it will be uh, tokenized and the user will get this uh, 20% uh, in uh, his account. As for the uh, rest, uh, 10%, uh, it is going to be transferred to the next pool, waiting for the next contributors to join. And once it fills uh, uh, for one equal share, then a user receives 10% uh, additionally. All right, so moving on to our next question. Uh, the question here is pretty simple. Exactly how will tokenizing assets work? Um, I, I can take that question. So Basically, the XRP has a feature called uh, IOUs. So essentially, um, an issuer or a gateway, which is in Sologenic, can issue tokenized assets. So when a user places an order and the order is fulfilled um, on the platform, it is automatically tokenized on the XRP ledger. 
So what it means is basically this token is generated in, in the ledger and is being um, put into a custody. So as the user is trading, they can actually see what is being tokenized um, from their orders. So um, a good example is, let's say you buy a share of uh, you know Tesla, or even you contribute to the pool and you buy like half a, a share of Apple or whatever, and you can see instantly in your screen that um, the amount that you buy is tokenized on demand. So this is what we call the on-demand tokenization. And that's, that's what we think um, will change the game because we are not tokenizing anything based on our preferences, but the user is actually tokenizing um, what they want. Um, so this is how it works. We have more information in our white paper on more technicals, and um, you can you can see the white paper on solgenic.com. All right. So uh, we have a little. Bit oh, go ahead. No, I'm done. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, we have got a little bit of a follow-up to that, which is, does the Sologenic asset tokenization work during the weekend uh, when the stock exchanges are closed? If yes, how will it affect the prices on the exchanges? Um, well, Sologenic is uh, a bridge between um, financial markets, like stock markets, and soon other markets, um, and the blockchain. So essentially what Sologenic has to do is to act um, and, and play with the rules and the, the policies of the external uh, markets, which are the actual stock market. So on the weekends, um, Sologenic is, uh, if, if an exchange is closed, Sologenic does not provide um, service to, um, for tokenization or buying and selling of that specific asset. However, users can still trade all those assets on the decentralized exchange. So let's say I buy one share of uh, an asset. I always use the example Tesla. So I, I buy one Tesla, and we have actually interest from a lot of market makers that are interested to participate into market making all these uh, you know, different assets. So what happens is um, these market makers will <laughs> tokenized they will come to Sologenic let's say on a Monday they buy um, shares and they will transfer these shares to the decentralized exchange and allow everyone else to trade them 24 7 so trading on the decentralized exchange there are no rules and it's not governed by anyone but the blockchain however because we're actually playing with the game with the rules of the external markets when we are buying that, when we're tokenizing, it means we're actually buying that stock. So when you're buying one Tesla, we are buying one Tesla. We're putting that one Tesla into custody and we tokenize it. And then we give you that tokenized asset. And then after that, that tokenized asset can be traded in fractions and so on. But at the point when we are actually buying or selling, we are still dealing with the exchanges. Okay, so our next question here comes from Ryan uh, Sheriffa, uh, which is asking, creating trust line is not free. Does the required number of XRP, uh, sorry, how does the required number of XRP adapt to the price of XRP if it goes up or down? Um, so, I mean, XRP is an asset. And if you consider trading between assets, it always, um, I mean, when, when you make a trade with your XRP or any other asset, USD, solo, whatever, it doesn't matter. When you open a position, it means that you have sold your XRP and you have gained an asset. So you no longer have an XRP, but you have another asset which you bought with XRP. And so that means um, you, can, you can trade between these assets um, in, in the exchange. So when you no longer hold the asset, all right, when you no longer hold XRP, whether it, its value goes up or down, it doesn't really matter. But now you have, an, you have a position for Tesla. So it's, it's like giving your XRP and buying one Tesla. So you, you, you would you probably not have both at the same time if you're trading in between the two pairs.
So another question I have here is when does the live version of Sologenic launch? Uh, yeah, I can cover this question. So uh, from the product uh, or technology perspective, uh, the live version has uh, very little difference from the simulator that we just announced today. So we have the simulator based on the testnet that is identical to the live net. And for this reason, uh, we're ready to launch the live trading as soon as we have all needed uh, licenses in place. I don't want to give any deadlines, uh, but uh, I'm quite positive that we are going to launch it uh, sometime uh, first half of next year. Okay, that's exciting. Uh, another question we have here is, if I contribute to a pool... Can I add something to Dimitri's answer? Oh, yes, please, please. Okay. Just want to add yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's good if we both answer, like, put and, and add things to the um, the con, like, the, to the question. So basically, what I am, um, we have done here is we have released the simulator, as Dimitri mentioned, and the sole purpose of releasing the simulator is to get feedback from the community and from the users. And so while we're obtaining the licenses and so on, we can improve the simulator and we can make sure that it works as what we, you know, as we expect it to. Um, so we, we really welcome any feedback from anyone who's going to use the simulator. Um, we appreciate if people can tokenize assets, uh, withdraw, trade at the testnet, um, decentralized exchange and so on, and just give us feedbacks. And uh, we'll, we're gonna work on those feedbacks. We're gonna improve the system. We have uh, been busy the past few months building the simulator. And the sole purpose for that was to make sure that we have the actual product and so that the only thing that's pending are the licenses. Thanks. Thanks. So back to the question that I had here is that if I contribute to a pool and before the pool completes, I want to get out of it, can I withdraw the money subject to some fees? Absolutely not. Uh, we do not charge any fees for uh, canceling order, an order. So uh, uh, if the order is still not filled, uh, then no fees are going to be charged. However, if a user decides to purchase a certain stock uh, for the crypto assets, uh, we need to convert those crypto assets to the uh, base fiat currency that a certain stock exchange operates with. So uh, there might be some conversion uh, fees involved, but again, it's only uh, for the uh, purchasing stocks with your crypto assets. Now, the next question I have lined up here is that uh, if I tokenize an asset, like in the demo where there's the tokenization of Tesla with XRP, if both Tesla and XRP increase in value, will it boost my returns or will it do the opposite? Um, like I said, I think a, a similar question was asked. Uh, it doesn't really matter. They are interchangeable. When you have Tesla, you can, I mean, you, you trade your XRP with the Tesla, so you can't hold both at the same time. Um, so if you pay 200 XRP to get one Tesla or whatever, um, you no longer have the XRP. So if the value of XRP goes up or down, it doesn't really matter on your open position. Now, here's a big question. How long before the full launch in the US? I mean, we have all the technology, everything, like everything is ready. It's just a matter of um, regulations, licenses, and so on. So there's no clear answer for that as we're moving forward with acquiring licenses for the first few jurisdictions that we're looking for. So once we get these jurisdictions um, you know, once we get license for the for, for these jurisdictions, we're going to move. And the whole the idea is to to allow anyone in the world to use um, you know DeFi and Solgenic, and to basically be able to tokenize assets on the blockchain. I probably can add something to this question as well. So basically, uh, we are initially we are focusing on the European uh, regulations. So uh, we should definitely start from Europe, but uh, we gradually expand our foot footprint. And uh, it is just not uh, physically possible to co uh, cover all uh, 
potential and promises locations, such as uh, US, Canada, and many others. But uh, from that, I would also like to mention that we have uh, a franchise program uh, for Coinfield, where we are partnering with the individuals or companies by, by joining forces uh, for entering a certain market. So currently, we're strongly considering to have the same for Sologenic. So if anyone is interested in uh, this type of partnership, please contact us. So the next question I have here is, could it sometime in the future be possible to send tokenized assets from Sologenic to another wallet, for example, onto a Ledger Nano? Um, yes, of course. I mean, Ledger Nano or any, any other device that supports the XRP Ledger transaction, um, um, they, they, they can essentially open a trust line with the uh, issuer, which is Sologenic, and you can transfer any assets to any XRP address. So let's say that you hold one Tesla in your personal wallet and your friend, um, you know, you want to send that one Tesla to your friend. So your friend simply has to open a trust line with the issuer, which is Sologenic, and then you will be able to send the one Tesla. And, uh, you know, all the other, um, I mentioned in my, in my talk that dividends and, and the interactions with the tokens after they're being issued will now happen with the new owner of the, of the token, which is your friend. So the next question we have here, I think is pretty interesting. Will we be able to pool shares with specific individuals, for example, family members or business partners, or will it always be randomly generated? Um, pool orders are like Uber pool. So basically, you don't really know who you're going to share share your ride with. And the, the you know the, the 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 point about it is to make a pool filled as soon as possible. So it's not a good practice to limit a pool because you want to get the pool filled so that your order gets executed as soon as possible. And you wouldn't really need to know who is in participating in the pool. It might be a market maker. It might be an institution. It might be an individual that is also trying to do the same thing. Um, so the whole idea behind pool orders are for, for individuals who cannot contribute and get a whole share to um, invest with as little as capital as they want, like $10, so, you know, 10 friends can actually do the same thing in the same pool, and they might actually be sharing the same pool with other people. But yes, of course, they can contribute to the same pool. Now, next question I have here is that uh, if, I shed, if I set up a trust line on my wallet but want to send to a friend, do they need to set up a new trust line? Yes, of course. Yes. Any XRP address on the ledger, which require to have a trust line with the gateway, which is Sologenic. And once they've done it, they can receive um, any uh, any token of asset. And, and once they establish the trust line, they can uh, conduct transactions and trades under the centralized exchange. And full guides on how to establish a trust line and what is required to do so how much XRP you need, what exactly you need is on the Sologenic platform. So if you want to establish a trust line, there's a, there's a guide, you can click, and then it will tell you exactly how you can establish that trust line. And similarly, if you want, uh, you can delete or remove a trust line. So you, you, you don't have to, it's, it's not a one-way communication, communication, but you can also remove a trust line because establishing a trust line would require an XRP address to hold at least five XRP. So these are the technicals that are well documented on um, on the steps that you're tr you 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 know you're establishing. But when you want to release the XRP, you can actually remove that trust line, and and those funds will be released. All right. Our next question is pretty simple. Will more solo ever be created? No. No. Solo was produced and on the X, on the XRP ledger. And at the time it was um, created, um, the formula our team used was to burn the issuer. So the issuer no longer exists. So it is impossible 
for more solo to be generated because that issuer has a burnt address. And if anyone is interested, they can actually check the address for the solo issuer or the gateway on the XRP ledger um, sites like xrpl.org or bithomp.com. Uh, they can actually search for solo um, address and they will see that the master key is disabled and it is impossible for uh, the issuer to produce more so. Okay, we have time for one last question here. This comes from Shane Ellis who asks, uh, may I ask, do you have buy-in or interest from any institutions? Thank you. Well, uh, yeah, go ahead, Dimitri. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so Solonex is something that we are um, aiming to provide uh, institutions with. And we have this nice piece of technology uh, that covers all the tokenization, uh, integrating with uh, different uh, liquidity providers, uh, stock exchanges, and everything. So uh, having uh, uh, this technology in our hands, we easily can uh, contribute to this uh, DeFi adoption by offering this uh, to established uh, uh, financial institutions. However, uh, we are just launching this uh, project uh, in a couple of days. So it is uh, like the plans are there, but it's uh, too early to say something uh, practically. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dimitri and Reza, for taking the time to do this AMA and answering so many questions. Uh, I'm sure all of our audience and I myself greatly appreciate uh, you taking the time to do so and uh, yeah, shedding so much light on the Sologenic project. Thanks, Brent. Thank, thank you, Brent. everyone. Yep. Thanks, everyone. It was a pleasure to meet you. Uh, yep. We've now come to the end of DeFi X Solo. Thank you to all of our guests today, and thank you to everybody watching from all over the world. We hope you enjoyed the event as much as we did. If you would like to start using the tokenization asset simulator for yourself, go to sologenic.com to sign up. If you'd like to keep up to date with Sologenic and take part in more AMAs and giveaways, then follow Sologenic on Twitter, at RealSologenic, and join our Telegram group, at Sologenic X Go Solo. Thanks again for joining us today. Take care.